Hello again, friends, and welcome to another edition of the 605 Super Podcast, the only podcast on Turner Time. The Mothership! The best wrestling podcast on the planet, the only wrestling podcast that matters, the most influential wrestling podcast. Call somebody. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. It's me! The hardest working man in wrestling podcast. Yeah! Baby, baby. What are you trying to prove? And I'm very happy to welcome back to the co-host chair today, one of the most popular people we have on the show, Howard Baum. Howard, welcome back to the show. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> it gets funnier each time you do it. You know that. I've given up on being original. I'm just going to go with that from here on in, man. But even the way you delivered it, your voice changed. <laughs> compared well, now I'm, now I'm married to it. Now I'm embracing it. So uh, all these times I thought I was going to come up with something better each time. But this is it, man. This is it from here on in. What's your favorite wrestler catchphrase? Ooh, geez. I wish you would ask me these things in advance. Favorite wrestler catchphrase. <laughs> Uh, meet me at the bar at 11.15. <laughs> I have no idea. My favorite wrestler... Cat- is it my stuff is or off the street? <laughs> my, my stuff is more obscure. Like, I don't like the actual catchphrases. I like the accidental catchphrases. So that would... We'll have to table that. I'll have to think about that one. Well, that's all it was for so long. There weren't really catchphrases. There were just right. things that guys would say on a video, and then you would trade it around and see it, and you loved it. Right. Speaking of which, that, that little soundbite you just played, when I, uh, I think it was 09, I was in Charlotte, and um, I found out that everybody went upstairs and smoked a joint with Gary Hart. And I'm like, oh my God, I would have given my left arm and leg to do that. And they were talking about how he, um, somebody brought up acid to him, and he, would, he, and he goes, I would have to know who the chemist was. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I don't disagree with him. Yeah, definitely, because I always wanted to do that, but I would never do it in this day and age. You know, you don't know what you're doing. I want to expand my consciousness. I'm not, I don't do drugs for partying. I do drugs for enlightenment. You know what I mean? And that's the way to do it. And I've never done anything serious. I'm just a weed and Jack and Coke guy. Oh, okay. You know? You're I've, talking a big game, and then you're like... I've never oh. even done shrooms. I'm, I mean, if it was the olden days, I would have done acid, but uh, I don't trust what goes on today with the kids. So do mushrooms you know? instead. Yeah, I have to get a good batch. A friend of mine actually gave me some shrooms. I held on to them for about two years. I looked up the recipe and everything. I made up the tea. And all it did was give me diarrhea. Well. (laughs) I put a whole day aside, and all it did was clean me out. So I guess there's a silver lining in there somewhere. You got to eat it the first time, at least. You got to, because it'll never, it'll always taste worse each time you try it. So the first Hmm. time, eat it, because it'll never be that good again. Huh. Yeah, I tried eating a few and it didn't do anything. And then I'm like, I made the tea and like, still nothing. But I was light as a feather, so silver linings. From what I understand, we have a few chemists that listen to this show. So maybe someone will get in touch with you and help you out. But hmm. as we get going here, Howard, I did want to play something. Uh, this video popped up recently. I think it may have been posted in the Mothership. I'm not sure, but I had never seen it before. And it was from, it is from. The summer of 1980 in Philadelphia, I assume, because it's Phil Zacco on this. And, of course, you think Phil Zacco, you think Philadelphia. And I'm going to play some of this, and then I'll stop it, and you and I can talk about some of the things that are said, because there's some ridiculous comments in this video. Oh, tremendous. That sounds good. All right, so let's kick this off, and uh, I'll stop it when I think it's an appropriate point. Well, as I hope you know, we invite your suggestions and always welcome them. We've gotten some pretty good ones, too, over the months for stories for Sports Scene Magazine. And we're about to deliver on one of your most frequent requests. Why don't you, we're asked again and again, do a story on professional wrestling? Well, a couple of weeks ago, when the show played at the Civic Center here in town, we went and we saw, and now we show you. By the way, it was obviously the Civic Center. I got the wrong arena. But anyway, back to, mm-hmm. back, back to the action. The days of the Roman Empire, the era of gladiators, and the spectacle of the Christians and lions. How far removed are we in 1980? Not very far. But it all depends, I suppose, on how you view things. The spectacle of professional wrestling perhaps touches that period of time closest. The Romans delighted in the kill. You get an instant kill on the red. Here. Here. Always remember, 
Go for the red first, because if you don't, your opponent will. Today's spectators are a bit more subdued, but a little blood now and then is appreciated. Then, as opposed to now, it was the real thing. Illusion seems to be the key to professional wrestling today. In other words, what you see and what you think you see oftentimes are two different things. But the sport of professional wrestling is trying hard to change its image. Let's see then what we can uncover about the sport. So now he talks to Pat Patterson. Uh, that should be good. Pat Patterson. Are you guys animals? I'm not an animal. I'm a human being. I have a few, few girlfriends and not an animal. Well, I had a girlfriend one time that called me an animal. <laughs> well, I didn't get... Wow. <laughs> First of all... So much. So much to unpack already. 13 seconds into it, there's so much going on. Oh, my God. This alleged journalist, the first question he asks anyone is, <laughs> I have a serious question for you. Are you an animal? That's the first You're question right. he asks. And, of course, Pat Patterson talking about his bevy of girlfriends who think he's... Yeah. Animal. Oh, my God. So much going on. In wrestling, there's a little bit more violence than in any other sport, and that's what the people like to see. You know, years ago, it was strictly, strictly wrestling. And today, people don't want to see that. They want to see, they want to see a fight. They want to see blood and guts. That's what they want to see. So what you're telling me is, when I see blood tonight, if I should see blood tonight, it's not a capsule, it's real. I'll guarantee you. And if, if it happens, you see something, I'll invite you to the dressing room and you can look at it. Oh, you know, you know, a lot of people laugh at you guys in this business. Well, you know that. I mean, uh, I'm sure you've heard it and seen it. Uh, and they say, you guys up there, just a bunch of actors. Uh, I wouldn't watch professional wrestling for any amount of money now this is bob backland answering this hey, what's your reaction well, to that um i could show you that you're a pretty good actor too if i put you in a wrestling hold i could make you scream and i could smile and talk to the camera like i didn't even do anything to you and those people out there would say that you were just doing that because they wouldn't understand how easy i could hurt you um when i get into that ring that bell rings i'm gonna want to win I may wear a nice jacket in the ring. Uh, I may do some exercises in the ring when the bell rings. I'm just as serious as if I was playing football or any other professional sport. Wrestling. That is maybe the best Bob Backlund promo from mm -hmm. the time he won the belt until the mid-90s, right there. I have never quelled over Bob Backlund as I just did. That was like the greatest thing he ever said. He was convincing. You believed him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I could. He should have done that during. He should have done that during his career. He might have been more popular. <laughs> Next is longtime promoter Phil Zacco. Then uh, Phil in 1980 does it have a better name than it did say 10, 15 oh, yeah. years ago. Yes, it has a better image all the way around. Well, well, let me let me say this. Now we go to the Garden every month. Now we couldn't go to the Garden last month. We went to Shea Stadium. Now, we drew 87,250 people, over a half a million dollars in money. Now, hold on. Where did he pull that fucking <laughs> right, from? Right, at 50. At 50, I like that. It's 50, exact. <laughs> right. Now, so that, they're not idiots. Now, you can't, you know, nobody can sell me that they're going in to see something all popped out. They're going in to see... These fellas to use their, uh, use ability. Their, their ability to the best. And they can do it, and they're built for it, and they train. But, Bill, there's a lot of show business surrounding professional well, wrestling. You do have it, a fellow with a gown, and a fellow like Haystack Calhoun. Naturally, if I tried to tell you that Haystack Calhoun could jump four feet or eight feet, I'd be kidding. I'd be insulting your intelligence. And uh, like Gorgeous George, and uh, but I remember by the same token, Gorgeous George was a great wrestler. So if we see blood in the ring... Even back then they were doing that shit where, well, yeah, Gorgeous George was ridiculous, but he was a great wrestler. Right. Even Phil Zacco, who, by the way, you want to know, Vince McMahon takes over a couple years later. This is who he took over from. It was this guy and the partners. Could you imagine this guy being involved in the WWF after 1982? But that's wrestling. That's like Chris Dundee when I used to deal with the old timers. I mean, that was wrestling. Like Joe McHugh introducing Phil Zacco under the auspices. You know, all that stuff. Like, I like an old man ring announcer. I like an old yes. man promoter. That's what it's all about. Central casting. It's real, Phil. Quite. I'll tell you what. This is the one thing that irritates me to no end. If you see blood in that ring, 
and if it isn't blood from the person that you see it on, I'll give a thousand dollars to your charity. You come into a sport where a lot of people, quite frankly, just actually let me pause it. He's talking to Ernie Ladd now. Don't believe. Well, I've had about five operations with wrestling. I've had about four from uh, playing pro football and uh, consequently, you know, I get twisted around. Of course, I twist a lot of people around. You know, I'm not normal on the other end. Uh, issuing out the punishment, you know. Mm-hmm. I can't make anyone believe anything, but I can assure you one thing. Like if I get a headlock on you right now and squeeze your head till your eyes pop out, then you'd be quite a believer. Ernie, <laughs> are you... Then don't take this wrong. Are you an animal? In the worst way. I probably would pay my mama if she got my dream. <laughs> and you're serious. Hold on. Did he ask every single wrestler, are you an animal? That was his go-to, apparently. That's really some way to get some locker room heat. My God, are you an animal? And ironically, the the only guy he didn't ask was George Steele. <laughs> exactly. Maybe that was go his figure. thing, though. Like, he would go to like plane crashes and be like, I'm here. I have the survivor here. Are you an animal? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's finish this up. As a heart attack. That's correct. See, so can't no promoter tell me what to do. No time. They don't, a lot of times they don't like the way I talk on television when I'm being interviewed. Hey, they don't own me. That's why I'm Ernie Ladd. Because I do exactly what I want. And I said that sincerely. I said on a stack of Bibles. Uh, if my mother was dead, I would say it's still on her grave. I'm my own man. If you want to change that, then hey, it just don't work. That's all. Professional. Re- and now they interview this old lady fan who's like the last of this breed. The women who would sit at ringside and charge the ring, pound on the ring, <laughs> attack the heels. So let's uh, get, hear a few words from her. Wrestling depends and survives on its fans, perhaps more so than any other sport, because the fan is such an active, integral part of professional wrestling. Ms. Krieger, how long have you been a wrestling fan? 24 years and, and a half. And you're not uh, 35 years old either, are you? No, not hardly. <laughs> I'm 81 years old, February, I'll be 82. What is it you like about this sport? The roughness, rough, it's exciting. You like the violence and the blood? Oh, yeah. If it's good, I wouldn't go. Now, do you believe that it's real, what's happening in that ring? I think so. You do? I think so, yeah. If I didn't, I wouldn't go. You really get excited and really get up about these matches, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. Do you ever get mad at these guys? Yeah. Sometimes I call them bad name. What? What's a bad name you might call one? Oh, never mind. Sometimes you're uh, you uh, get in a shoving match, pushing match. Yeah. I bet you. I bet you're pretty strong too. I hit them. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> and they show video behind that of her at ringside running to the ring. Her, like, charging after Ernie Ladd. And she's this little, tiny, frail old lady. And you see, like, security trying to keep her away from the wrestlers. Really, really funny stuff. But that Phil Zacco quote, 87,250 <laughs> in Shea Stadium. A new record. See, I miss those guys, those Phil Zaccos and all those old guys. That's what it was all about back then. Like, pseudo-mafia, northern accent, talking guys. They Sometimes not the pseudo. Syndicate. Yeah, right. I mean, that's that was wrestling, man. I had a, I broke in under Chris Dundee and Duke Kiyomoka, you know, and... Uh, what was Chris Dundee like? Chris Dundee was right out of central casting. Like, if you were going to cast a boxing promoter at the Miami Beach Convention Hall, that would have been the guy. Big spectacles, just walked around. I didn't... I, he was not a gregarious guy, but... Yeah. Just exactly what you would think of an old-time boxing wrestling promoter. He worked out of the Fifth Street gym. He did boxing and everything. My dad actually got to know Angelo pretty well because when my mom had the cancer around 1997, Angelo's wife was going through the same thing. So my dad would always bump into him at the hospital for treatments and stuff. So they kind of got to know each other. And um, Angelo's office was right by me on the Hollywood Circle, too, at the time. But... You know, it was bad times for everybody at that time, but my dad got to know him a little bit. Dundees were totally cool. You know, it's exactly what I mean. I, I didn't really know Chris that well, but he knew a friend of mine and they started. Um, he became my hookup for tickets at the convention hall before I got to shoot ringside. But he was a institution, no doubt about it. it. You don't. I did a search for him and he's like 
nowhere to be found, really. Like, there's three pictures of him on the entire internet, but he was a big deal down here. Obviously, you broke in around Chris Dundee. You broke in in South Florida, Miami. What was the ring rat scene like? There were a bunch. They always seemed to occupy, like, um, the same section, the first row, like, four to five rows on the dressing room side. You know who you are. There was, like, a blonde one, a redheaded one, a long brown-haired one. And, like, uh, this really old bat-looking one, and somebody said to me, you know, that's Harley Race's girlfriend when he comes to town. And I can't verify that, but you can kind of picture it. <laughs> <laughs> I have no proof. Did she have a perm? Um, <laughs> it changed color every two years. That's the odd thing about it. <laughs> and then when she grew the sideburns, I really threw in the towel. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated with the hair decisions that Harley Race made throughout. His right. Career. I like how he had a handsome period. There was like, um, you know, the lead up to the Super Bowl of wrestling with Superstar Graham and Harley Race. And the interviews were classic because Superstar Graham was out there looking like a million bucks next to the confident Harley Race. And Harley Race is like, I don't need all that Hollywood fancy stuff. I went through that phase. You know, and he just decided he was going to be a grizzled veteran at the age of 32, and uh, that was it. You know what I just saw the other day? I don't know why this reminded me of it. I'd never seen this before. It was on YouTube. It was Memphis footage from the summer of 77, mm -hmm. and it was Homer Odell managing Frank Morrell, the Angel, and Brute Bernard. Have you seen this? That was not where I thought you were going to go, but no. Brute Bernard, Homer Odell's covered in yellow paint, and he's on the mic, and, and I believe he threatens to kiss Lance Russell. And <laughs> Brute Bernard headbutts the desk, grabs the other mic, and just holds it in front of his face and starts going, ah! while the, everything else is going on, but he starts wiggling his legs also at the same time. And then yeah, he gets, that was a, then he gets that was a Brute Bernard move. Yeah, I never saw that before. We know, did you ever discuss with Cornette about how he was terrified of Homer Odell? A little bit, a little bit about that. Because that always stuck in my mind, like when they did that pseudo Georgia promotion, when um, I think Bill Dundee was booking and like some of the Summer Memphis of guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like the pseudo Memphis promotion when like Oli, I don't know, I'm not a specific, I'm not a detail guy as we all know. But um, so Cornette said Homer Odell was always packing heat and he was like terrified of him. He didn't want to get on his bedside. Yeah, I believe he stayed in the same apartment complex with him. And, oh, I wish I could remember it exactly now, but I want to say they, like, caught him cooking raccoons or something. Or cooking squirrels. Oh, my God. Something ridiculous. Cooking roadkill. Oh, kill. my word. Something Jeez. along those lines. These old school guys, see? It's like today, everyone with their facials and tanning beds. Look what wrestling used to be. George Foreman grills. Right. They used to put a, a hamburger patty on the, on the hood of a car and drive to the next <laughs> town, and that would be dinner, you know? It is pretty crazy, oh, all those man. stories of all those guys just drinking in cars, throwing the beers out the window, yeah, eating whatever. Road signs, killing alligators. <laughs> Steve Kern shot Barry Windham in the leg. or I mean, like, Dick Slater what? got shot in a bar by Wahoo McDaniel. Like, you know, you got to have a pretty good immune system. I was always in love with the business, but there was no chance this sickly Jew from Miami was ever going to make it as anything but a photographer because there was just no chance. How do you stand up to a life on the road with all these tribulations, you know? Does everyone in South Florida have a crazy Dick Slater story? Wow. I have one that I can't even tell you. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> I guess we have to. No, but he was cool to me. I mean, he's a cool guy. He was like a silent but deadly kind of guy. He wasn't overly gregarious. I was a big fan of his, and I bumped into him a lot. And he used to go out with Luna, and I was friends with Luna. And so, um, you know, it's all about who you know. So I'm like, I remember one time in 09, Humperdinck and Dick Slater were at the bar in Charlotte at a convention. And, you know, Luna's real name is Gertrude. So Dick Slater says to Humperdinck, and I go way back with Humperdinck, like I was really in good with him. He was, I can actually consider him a friend. Like, you know, there's associates and there's people that you're, that you see so much, you can actually call him a friend. I was actually friends with Humperdinck. And um, so Slater, who I only met like a couple times, he said something about Trudy the Beauty, who was one of the Florida rats. And Humperdinck is like, oh, blah, blah. And like, I'm like, no, no, no. He means, uh, Gertrude, Luna. And then everybody knew I was in like Flynn because I knew enough to know that Luna was really Gertrude. And then, you know, then Slater would like totally opened up to me. Slater was cool. 
you know, he was always a big favorite of mine. He's another guy that's kind of lost to history because unless you saw him, and now it's boiled down to all these armchair um, wrestling experts are like, oh, he was just a Terry Funk copy. And he was not, because when I was a kid, I didn't sit there and say to myself, oh, there's a Terry Funk copy. I said, there's a really, truly unpredictable guy, hence unpredictable Dick Slater. And he was great. He was a natural, definitely. However, you, you, when did you first realize he was a Terry Funk copy? Ooh, 30 years later, when people started <laughs> talking about it. Like, a matter of fact, I even said to Terry Funk once at the bar in CAC, I think it was 05, and I said, well, I'm never coming back, so I'm going to give Terry a speech. I go, listen, I'm not going to mark it up with you or anything, because Terry kind of knew me. I met him a, a ton of times. I go, but this is my last time, and I just want to tell you something that – Nobody has given me so much enjoyment during my wrestling career as a fan because of all the guys, you always did that one Terry Funk thing during a match that literally would make me crack up or smile. And I'm not an easy audience. I don't pop for everything, but I'll be gosh darned if Terry Funk didn't matter if he was working with Lawler, Funk, whoever. I mean, Lawler, Funk. Dusty, no, no, no. Well, Dory in Japan, technically, well, that's, that's what true. I was talking one about. Time, one time, one Right, right, right. No, but he would always do some Terry Funk thing, and I'd go like, oh, my God, he's the greatest. And he was. And I told him, I go, you know, all these guys get a, get a knockabout. Bob Orton Jr., Dick Slater, they're all Terry Funk knockoffs. And he goes, well, that's why I had to change it up, because I had all the Dick Slaters and Bob Ortons <laughs> watching me. <laughs> well, the thing is, Terry Funk... When he leaves the locker room, it's a whole nother mm -hmm. thing. It's a whole nother thing. He's in a whole nother mindset, even if you had just spoken to him a few minutes before that. Mm -hmm. Dick Slater is Terry Funk 24 hours a day. He takes that character yeah. and he takes it outside the arena. Oh, my God. One time in the bar, I think it was 92, 93 war games in maybe Jacksonville. 92, probably. Okay, and it was like the Dangerous Alliance, whatever that, whatever the card yeah, that 92, was against 92. against Dustin Steamboat, whatever town that was in, and I was up there shooting for um, Power Slam Superstars of Wrestling. It was known at the time, the English magazine for Finn Martin, and I'm up there shooting. And after the show, I'm at the bar, and Dick Slater's leaving, and um, he's leaving with this rat, not the most attractive one of all time. <laughs> And the bar was really cool. It was like a multi-level bar and like everybody had their little alcove. And so I was right in the middle of the bar and Dick Slater's leaving with this rat. And I don't know what somebody said to him, but it was, it was like, Hey, I see you leaving with that rat. It, it wasn't that, but that was the, that was the, <laughs> you know, that was the yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gave a look and I knew Dick Slater and I'm like, Oh my God, it's going to go down. But it didn't, because apparently he wanted to get laid more than he wanted to kill somebody that night. But when he gave that guy the look, it was like he was walking, and then he tilted his head with that Dickie Slater expression of like, oh, it's going to go down. But it didn't. How many times have you been in the bar when Flair was there? Oh, my God. The, right up there with the Terry Funk title change, this is the great thing that I missed in my life. I never saw Flair twirl his wiener around like a helicopter. I never saw him do anything. The most I ever saw him do, Flair's deal was he would always like, act like he was in a hurry. One night I was with my friend Dave Flaherty in the Marriott Miami, which is we call the Fabe Bar. And um, Dave Flaherty happened to have these posters from Super Brawl 91. And Flair was with the WWF at the time. It was like 92. And he was working Randy Savage that night at the Knight Center. So at the bar, they had this big grand piano. And Flaherty lays out the posters. And he has two posters. And, um, like, you know, I told Flair, Hey, I'm a photographer since the olden days, Miami beach convention center. He's like, Oh yeah. I pretended to be interested for a minute. He autographed the posters to us, to Howard, the best photographer going today. And I go, Rick, sign it. The best photographer going today. Woo. And he like, he's like, okay. He no sells me. And he put everything I wanted him to say, except the woo. I'm like, all right. He didn't know how to spell he's it like, yet. Right, right, right. Everyone, remember when everyone used to say "woo" like W H O O, yes, and, and then and then people corrected people and go, they go, it's not "who," it's "woo." So <laughs> after that, you started seeing that. But Flair's like, okay, guys, I gotta go. Like, it, like if you're a guy, if you're a man, he has three seconds for you. Like, I appreciate that. He's always. He's always courteous but brusque. Like, all right, guys, I appreciate. Like, he's, like he's meeting with Henry Kissinger in five minutes. Like, you know, he has important business. Ten minutes later, we see him back down there at the bar, 
with his hand on the back of this slightly unattractive older woman. And I'm like, wow, he's really, he's really reaching. But I never saw any of the hijinks. But my friend Penelope Paradise, who is a female worker back – oh, I hope she's a female worker with that name. But my good friend Penelope, Penelope Paradise, Paradise. – <laughs> my good friend Penelope Paradise, she was tight with Luna, and um, she was a good girl. Her real name is Kim, and I just bumped into her this last year at CAC. That was a big surprise. And she told me about, like, how Flair was down there in his robe, like, doing the helicopter with his wiener and all this stuff. I'm like, you know, for all the stories, I've never seen that, and everyone I know has seen it. You think any fan has ever had the guts to go over to him and say, Rick, big fan, can I have your autograph? By the way, I like approaching women naked, too, and making mm. them really uncomfortable. <laughs> Maybe we should I get think together. <laughs> I think it flew back then, you know? I, I don't mean... know. For, for the hundreds of women who enjoyed seeing Ric Flair show up naked, how many thousands were disgusted at Ric Flair? Like, mm. who is this pig you know in the bar? Well, consider the audience. He was a good-looking guy up until about 2005. And I mean, if you're around Ric Flair, as are you knew who he was, it's, I mean, granted, if you're going to do it around civilian women, that's, that could, <laughs> could be problematic, I would think. Right, that's what I'm but talking about. I want to be, uh, I want to be in the world that Ken Patera and Ric Flair live in. I want to just do whatever the fuck I want, you know what I mean? Well, one went Those to prison days. and the other one lost all of his money. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> look, at, look at the good stuff that's on the other side of that ledger, you know what I mean? I guess, I don't know. Oh, they had it. They had it made, man. I mean, old wrestling was like old rock and roll. You fuck whoever you want. You do whatever you want. You're in the next town the next day. It's interesting that um, both Mike Graham and Dusty Rhodes were in love with the freedom of wrestling. And um, I remember a Mike Graham interview where he talked about his favorite thing was after the matches and hanging out with the guys and doing the rats and, you know, the whole the whole lifestyle. And Dusty... I saw somewhere was like, it was the same thing. He's like, I'm not as into the work as we call it, you know, the actual match and everything. He's into the, the hanging out and the drinking and the dipping and all that stuff. Like that was the least interesting part to him, the actual wrestling. Well, the sad part is Ric Flair was a heel and he gave you five times the amount of attention in that short period of time that Dusty Rhodes would have ever given you as a baby face. Very odd with Dusty. Very odd thing with him. And a lot of the baby faces, you know, we always say that the baby faces are assholes. Mike Graham has always been a really nice guy. I met him when I was a kid, and I met him later in life, like at the probably Wrestle Reunion in 05 was the last time I saw him. And he couldn't have been nicer. So that's there's a dyed-in-the-wool baby face. And uh, he was a really nice guy, I've got to say. But Dusty, not so much. All the time. Dusty was quite the shock when you – I remember uh, the PWF in 89, that short-lived promotion that he had. And yeah. we were backstage at the War Memorial Auditorium, and he had this flunky with him. And uh, he was so dismissive of the guy. And I was thinking to myself, why would this guy even deal with him being treated like that? Like, Dusty was back there, and, you know, the insiders were kind of milling around the photographers and whoever – and Dusty just, like, had his bag with him, and he said to the guy, go get me, blah, blah. You know, the guy just, like, <laughs> cowered away. Like, But he said it to him so rudely, you know? I don't remember what it was, but he was just so rude to the guy. I love that Terry Funk never let up on Dusty. Like, even, like, years later, he could be doing a shoot interview, and they'll be like, tell us about Dusty Rhodes. He'll be like, he's an asshole. Like, he'll run right away. <laughs> Go right. It's never like, I love Dusty. He's wonderful. It's always like, yeah, yeah. He's an asshole. I, I love it. And you can tell he's having fun with it, but he still says it every time. Yeah. You know what's so funny? If you watch even the oldest of interviews in 76, and we know that like people were told not to address Hulk Hogan's baldness, don't call Dusty Rhodes fat, don't call anybody <laughs> old, right? I mean, you don't want to diminish your opponent. But I was watching some old thing from 74, maybe 76, most likely 76, because that's where more footage is from. And he's like... That fat, overbearing, obnoxious. <laughs> now, see, I've got a theory about Terry Funk and Dusty Rhodes that has kind of been verified by Terry's wife and from my own observations and whatnot and from reading both of their books, which is that Terry is so cool and down to earth because he was always Terry Funk. And this is what his wife told me. I said, you know, out of all the big names, Dusty, Flair, and Terry and whatnot, Terry's the most down-to-earth, big name that I've ever met by far. And she goes, well, he was always just Terry because 
he grew up being Terry, and he grew up in the business, and he was always just Terry. I'm like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. He's just him. But when it comes to Dusty, he's a fat kid with a lisp who came from no money, and I think his entire career was, I'm going to snub you before you snub me, because I think he bears childhood wounds from being poor and fat with a lisp. And I think the whole thing is like, I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to shun you before you shun me. Very interesting. And a splotch. Don't forget a splotch. Nobody knows the origin of that. We have to consult a real uh, uh, dermatologist on that one day. How come that wasn't brought up in promos? And I'm afraid to wrestle you, Rhodes. I don't know if I'm going (laughs) to catch something from that splotch you have. Like, no one ever brought that up. Oh, and by the way, one night we were hanging out, it was backstage at ECW, probably 95-ish, and I was there with Dwayne Long, the PWI photographer, and we were talking to Terry, and he was sitting down on a crate back there, and um, we were hovering around him like, oh, how great, we're hanging out with Terry Funk, and once again, he was doing his low-talking thing, and somebody said how funny something he said was, and he goes, you know, I always, so I always told the truth. I called Gordon Soley an alcoholic. I called Dusty Rhodes. <laughs> I called Dusty Rhodes fat, and we were all cracking up because it was so true. You know, he's like, he goes, I just told the truth. He amuses himself, Terry Funk. He's great. You know, Adrian Street said here on this show that he got some heat in Florida, and it really screwed up everything with Dusty. He said he was doing a promo, and JJ, the assistant booker, told him, "Now you go out there and you say you're gonna." Whatever it was, you're going to punch Dusty in his fat face. Mm. And, and Adrian did it, and Dusty, that apparently he didn't know. That was the no-no, don't say fat. And yeah. he blames J.J. for setting him up. But who knows what the whole story is. But there's a situation where Terry Funk could call him fat. But they're really well, think about how many guys call Dusty Rhodes fat. Okay, but think nobody. But think Especially about when it. he got really fat. Okay, but Terry Funk was already famous when Dusty was just a gas station attendant trying to get booked with Terry. So Terry comes from this position of power to begin with. You know, he's like, he knew Dusty back then when he was nothing, and Terry was already something. So he feels free to say whatever he wants, because he knows the real Dusty. So he's like, you know, it's not, it's, he's not stardust to him. He's like, he's like, you know, just the guy from down the block that wants to break in. Yeah, and that's a really interesting way of looking at it, and you're probably right. And think about how Dusty treated Flair. It's the same thing. Flair wanted to be rambling Ricky Rhodes, and he idolized Dusty. And he was all bulky back then. Flair was destined to be a bruiser, crusher, Dusty type, big bulky guy, until they gave him the gimmick, the Paul Lee gimmick. That's what always fascinated me about the heat that developed between Flair and Dusty, especially as the 80s progressed, was knowing that beginning, was knowing that Mm -hmm. he was basically carrying Murdoch and Rhodes' bags everywhere. Not mm-hmm. even basically, he was carrying their bag, yeah. drinking with them, and he was their stooge. And then he got into business, and he wanted to be with them. And Rhodes is like, "Nah, <laughs> do your own thing." Yeah, <laughs> they abused him and shaved his head and did all kinds of you know ribs to him and everything. And he was the gopher. And I think that he was dusty. Of course, it's it's like a Donald Trump situation where he he eclipsed them because there wasn't a smart fan back then, and even some of the marks who were like, "Well, who's cooler than Ric Flair?" And then everyone's out there, you know, like calling Dusty, you know, whatever they called him. But I think that had a great at Dusty because there's no substitute for looking good. As David Lee Roth said, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're good while you're doing it. And that's what Flair did. And he was the coolest. And here's Dusty. I don't care who you are. You're not going to enjoy putting your underwear on and going out there big and fat like that. You know, I mean, everyone has an ego. Just think about it. It doesn't matter that you're Dusty Rhodes. You pose next to Rick, you pose next to Flair or Mil Mascaris or somebody, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm like a tub of goo over here. See, I don't think so. I think Dusty always seemed to me, despite whatever he appeared like at different times, I always thought he seemed like he was comfortable in his own skin. Well, that's overcompensation. You got to you got to play it. You know, I mean, he can't go out there like a mouse. I'm sure he's a confident guy because he was Dusty Rhodes. He was over and everything. But um, I even remember somewhere I heard some kind of story about how when he was going to go to WWE, he's like, well, I got to trim down or everything. And then they're like, no, we want you fat. Like, that's fine. Just be Dusty. But I'm sure he was aware of it. Like, what what fat person is, like, proud to be out there fat? I don't know. But uh, with that, (laughs) we'll move on. I know. I know Haystack Calhoun can't jump four to eight feet. That that much is true. Oh, my God. Phil Zacco with another great reference there. Let me tell you, Haystack Calhoun back in the day. 
I miss those. I miss, see, I miss feet. that. I miss that stuff so much. Like the the Joe McHugh, everybody Joe McHugh announced like that was old wrestling, you know, up to and including Joe McHugh. Like the timekeeper at the bell. I want to have a Joe McHugh off Mike with Scott Mittman. one day. <laughs> right. You know what I? Uh, I'm so impressed with these guys who could just make up numbers on the spot. <laughs> like not like a flat number, but like he did eighty eighty seven thousand. 252 or whatever he said he mm-hmm. just completely made up a number and inflated it by the real crowd what did he inflate it by close to fifty thousand. people yeah yeah <laughs> i know i know you know who was also great on those old shows like when um captain lou used to go on uh the morton downey show oh, oh is that classic stuff he used to he used to think it was like it was 1962 and he could pull the wool over everyone's eyes you know well, he would like point to his forehead and be like, they say we use razor blades. I've never used a razor blade in my life. My wife would leave me if I used a razor. And you look at his head and it's like a, <laughs> like a zigzag all over the place. Right. See, you say you can't do a Captain Lou. That was a perfectly tremendous Captain Lou. See, I don't hear it. I don't hear it the way you do. No, that's a good one. I like when he's subdued. See, I want to work on the subdued. <laughs> Dude, Captain Lou, that's a good well, you know, uh, a- well, you know, Vinny Jr., uh, that's a very good question. Like, he gets very, like, serious for a second, and then he loses See, his shit. And that's good. You do a good Captain Lou, I gotta say. That's good. <laughs> I gotta work on it. I gotta that's work hard on to it. do. It's all in the throat with Captain Lou. I've said it before. My favorite thing with Captain Lou is just how he would adopt the personalities of the teams he managed. When he managed yeah. the Moondogs, he dressed like a Moondog. When he right. managed the Samoans, he started dressing like he was Samoan. Right. When he managed the Japanese tag team. Not only did he dress like them, but he would, there's that promo going around where he tries to talk Japanese. Yeah. He's just making up words. And I don't know how Vince does not just crack. Uh huh. I think, I think I actually do know why, because he hated doing these promos with Lou. That's probably. Mm. Yeah, he had to hate him because he fired him every week and then he rehired him and all that. Well, because Lou, like a- Lou was the drunkest probably during yeah. the promos. And he was also the one, if you go back and watch those promos, the Grand Wizard a little bit, Blassie tongue in cheek. Lou is the only one who completely disrespects Vince every uh, single time out there. That's funny. Yeah. So you know, I was I was just watching a shoot where Morocco talks about, and this is something that I kind of thought in my head, but this is how subconscious wrestling was back then. That Morocco is like, you know, because when he ate the meatball sub during the squash match on TV, that was not the only time he ate a sub like that. And Morocco was telling this story about how he came down the aisle eating this sub. And a, and a Coke, and um, he's like, because I was trying to be like Captain Lou. I was trying to, like, make it like the way he was training me was making me become a big slob like Captain <laughs> Lou. You know? And I'm like, oh, I knew that. I knew that's what he was doing. Because if you watch, like, the Texas death match at Madison Square Garden against Morales, Morocco is, like, completely unshaven, completely unkept, yep. belt around his neck, like, completely, like, 30,000 people booing him, and he's just, like, swaggering in there, and he looked like such a bum, and that was, like, during the beach bum period. And um, I'm like, oh, that's, like, subliminal. He's, like, he's aligning with Captain Lou. No, and he definitely bulks up as his WWF run continues. And, look, I mean, you want to talk about a party circuit. The WWF was a party circuit, too, back then in 83, like, before the expansion. I remember George Hambacropolis told me this story years ago. She was like coming back from some show. This must have been the late 70s with a few of the guys. And she was very close with Ken Patera at the time. I think she may have actually dated Ken Patera for a brief period huh. of time uh, in the late 70s. But she said, she goes, and then Ken Patera gave me a pill and I didn't sleep for a day and a half. Like she couldn't get huh. home. And she's like, I'm going to fall asleep on the road. Ken was like, here, take this. And wow. got her home. Wow. Yeah, I know she used to run his fan club and stuff. Yeah. I, I did not realize. Yeah, she ran his fan club, Bruno's fan club, Buddy Rogers' fan club. The fan clubs, those just went away. Yeah, that's something. That was That's really, I mean, to even think about that is mind-blowing at this point. Do you think there's a place for it now? Like, not the WWE, per se, but, like, these independent guys who have created their own thing, who have their own merchandise, who create their own videos, have their own publicity that they control. Is there a place for fan clubs, or is it just something where the fan base they'd be selling to wouldn't want anything? Or is there something you could include in that to make it a valuable Hmm. proposition? I think it would have to be some kind of Patreon situation whereby the person would get a phone call or a meeting or come to the show and meet them. Like, it would be an updated version of the the fan club, because in the old days, it was an 8x10 
a mimeograph bulletin and a thank you for joining and a card, a membership a card. card. A membership card. Right. Yeah. Right. And now the people expect so much. Everyone is such a freaking prima donna on the internet. They, they expect the world delivered to them, you know? So I think it's all about the personal experience now because even bands are doing these meet and greets that you know they've got to hate. Bands have even got to do the social media. The Ace Freely's on there like, hey, great seeing all you guys. Hope to see you in Schenectady. Like, you know these guys don't want to do it. But everyone enjoys such an immersive one-on-one -on -one experience now. They expect nothing less than moving in with Ric Flair for a week, or it's not worth it to them. It's very interesting. And, you know, obviously one of the things with this is the guys are really not to worry about protecting the business in any way at all nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, now that you mention that, I happen to be doing some thinking, as I often do, before a show comes up. And when the last Star Wars, the very highly received Star Wars, the uh, what was the holiday? Labor Day. Ironic that I can't uh, <laughs> conceive of the topic of uh, Labor Day, but <sighs> being beaten to bum number two that I am. But, you know, we're all talking, me and Vandal and Scott and you, and we're all talking after the show went off the air about how the old-fashioned guys, the Eddie Grahams, would, like, knock a bar patron out at the drop of a dime if they said wrestling was fake, etc. They had to protect the honor of the business. And even as a kid, there were such glaring ridiculousnesses about this stance because I'm in a bar, I'm Eddie Graham. You say, oh, you guys are a bunch of phonies. Now I have to fight you. Wahoo McDaniel, Ric Flair, all those guys got in countless fights back in the day. Even as recent as Dustin Rhodes, I just saw him talking about how he would like drop a fan for saying you guys are fake and whatnot. But we're all talking about like how ridiculous that is because if you're going to protect the business, which I completely appreciate, and I'm a humongous proponent of kayfabe. But if you're going to protect the business, I made a little um, list of things that it just completely exposed the business by their very nature. And uh, you can add your own, but um, you have your throwing guys into the ropes, of course, which I would like to set up a camera somewhere. Just set up one hard camera somewhere. You line up 100 people, fat ladies, young boys, children. I don't care who you throw somebody into a rope and a hundred times out of a hundred times, they're not going to come back bouncing off those ropes with a drop kick, a uh, sunset flip, etc. You're not going to start running the ropes. There's not such momentum generated that you're going to start doing spots with it. With <laughs> you're going to throw some fat guy into the rope. He's either going to tumble to the bottom of the first and second rope, or he's going to fly outside the ring and be dead. You know, I mean, throw a human being into the rope. That, that takes no imagination, even for a seven-year-old, to know if you get thrown into something, where is this momentum that the ropes are going to make you fly back into a high spot onto somebody? When did that start? Who was the first person to get sent into the ropes and then right before you hit the ropes, turn around, take it on your back and run back towards the person? I think, actually, Jeffrey Bowdrin was there the first time that spot was done. It was <laughs> Sandor Sosbo in 1932. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to ask him about that, but I'm pretty sure he was there for that. So you'll have to ask him if there was a pop for that or whatnot. And then, of course, you have your repetitive spots, which, you know, if you throw somebody into the turnbuckle and they go head over heels, ass over tea kettle, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. That's like, that's going to happen once in a million. Like, oh, the guy threw me in and just the torque of my body made me fly over the turnbuckle and down onto the apron and down onto the floor. I almost killed myself. But if it happens 360 times, and it only happens to one guy, if it happens to be Ray Stevens or Ric Flair, like, oh, what are the odds? This guy can't learn how to prevent that spot. Like, every time he's thrown into the ropes, he has no way to stop himself. He's going to, like, damn near kill himself. Ass over tea kettle, like, every time that happens to him. So it's the repetitive spots again. Like, you know, it's a setup like, oh, I've seen this before. And if it ends the same way, that's exposing the business right there. And then, of course, if you're in a fight, how many, I don't know how many fights you've been in. I've been in none, but I know if I was to be, I don't know if I was to be in one, I wouldn't get a, a vertical scar right neatly lined up like how many days I'm doing in prison. I'll line up like there's four, I'm going to make a crossways. There's another four, I'm going to make a crossways. That's 20. You know, you're in a fight, no black eyes, no broken bones, but just little superficial red <laughs> scars across your forehead. But that's one of those wrestling things you never think about until you stop and think about it, where it's like, well, I've mm -hmm. never seen anyone just spontaneously bleed from the middle of their forehead <laughs> in any right. of the fights I, I've been in. 
you know what the old timers used to used to diffuse that with? They used to say, "Well, you know, our um, bodies are so toughened up and used to it. That's why we don't get black eyes or broken bones or anything. But we have scar tissue. So if you open up the old scar tissue, that's why we bleed so easily. And it's always on the forehead because that's where the th- the skin is the thinnest. Which you know, fine. In the seventies, that was wrestling logic. That was acceptable. Midgets in women." That exposes it right there because if you, if you, first of all, I have to say there's like so many cute girls in wrestling now. It's like a night at Tootsie's. It's like every girl in wrestling is so hot now. I miss the days of um, when all the women wrestlers used to look like truck drivers in a one piece bathing suit. <laughs> Why do you miss that? I don't. I was. I was for comedy. To, uh, <laughs> I think there. I have to enjoy. I have to say, I enjoy the eye candy now because it's uh, the outfits and the women and everything. Somehow, wrestling became cool to all these hot young girls, and that's a plus. It's certainly a plus. It doesn't do me any good, but <laughs> it's a plus. Of, what but, do you think of the idea that every promotion has to have women's matches? I'm a big fan and a big supporter of of women's wrestling, especially. I vocally have talked about how much I enjoyed. Things I've seen from the WWE's women division, not the Bella uh, era mm-hmm. stuff, but like the Charlotte and that whole crew. Yeah. I've enjoyed that, but now I notice every indie group has to have women's wrestling. And I think about that, and I think like if I had my own wrestling promotion, I don't know if I'd be able to focus on two different divisions right now and having two different groups of wrestlers being able to get in there. If I was Georgia Championship Wrestling in 1983, mm-hmm. would I be able to function if I also had to have a women's division? It's kind of well, rough. Totally different thing because the women were relegated back well, again, then. Again, I'm, I, obviously, I'm not talking about in and of it. So I'm saying if there was something like it was today where it's a fully fleshed out women's division as opposed to being in line with the midgets or Andre the Giant, a total yeah, attraction yeah. sent from one place to another as kind of a freak show. I've got to say that um, women's wrestling is one of the things that actually has benefited from whatever wrestling has evolved into because they're hotter, they can work better. You know, this is the uh, best period for domestic women's wrestling ever, and it would yeah. be the best period for women's wrestling ever worldwide if all Japan women hadn't existed for yeah, so many yeah. years, producing great matches. But no, this is the glory period right now. This is the golden yeah. age of women's wrestling in America, and they're all hot, and uh, the, the outfits lend themselves. I mean, it's a sexist thing to judge them on that, but the work is also better as well by a tremendous margin because. Uh, like with so many legends, I was excited to see Fabulous Mula. I saw her work Joyce Grable. I saw her work um, Despina Montegas. And it was the typical women's match back then. They roll around with the referee. They did all these midget spots. The thing that always took me out of a, of a women's wrestling match back in the day was how, and still this is still a little bit apparent, depending on what kind of an athlete or how big they are, but when you throw a woman into the rope, she always does that little hop thing. Like she's going to, you know what I mean? Like, skip. yeah. yeah. Like if somebody was throwing you into the rope, you can't assist them by skipping. If you're going to throw me into the rope, I'm not going to go like, oh, I'm not big enough. So I got to skip. I got to make sure this happens. You know, that that always took me out of the women's match and the, and the, and the midgets too. It was like the same kind of thing because they're not, it, the ring is not built for them. You know, you talked before about the whole idea of, you know, what it really is, how ridiculous it is sending someone into the ropes and having them come back at you. That's one thing. You know, if you do something, if you punch the guy in the face or you do a leapfrog, what do you think about when they do that and the two guys just kind of cross past each other nowadays? Mm-hmm. They run past each other and they just keep running and it's like, wait, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't you remember? It wasn't about setting up a spot. It was about pretending to beat your opponent. Yeah. You know, what's funny, I, as a kid, that kind of thing always marveled me, the timing of like when um, two to four guys, if it was a tag match, would run back and forth in perfect timing, they would hit their spot and whatever. But I happened to be watching some of the dying days of uh, the L.A. Olympic uh, matches, mm. and it was like Al Madrill mm. against um, Twin <laughs> Devils and whatnot, and they, and they did the thing where everyone attempts to run the ropes. And this happened three times during the set of tapes I was watching because I was making copies for somebody and I just happened to watch the whole thing. And like they completely lost their place in the middle of it, just like I thought <laughs> I would. You know, That's like, a big ring, were... too. That's a huge ring. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was always I love their, you know, the color scheme and everything, how the, the mat and the turnbuckles and everything was blue and the seats were blue. That's a um, some free advice to a promotion out there that the blue always works on TV. That's, you know. Hey, let me ask you a question. I want you to answer it in kayfabe. All right? Mm-hmm. Pretend like wrestling's real. Right. 
explain to me the philosophy. You know, like when the crisscross happens, one guy runs the one set of ropes and the other guy runs to the other set of ropes and it's happening at the same time. The second guy who does it, what's what's he thinking in that moment? The other guy's already mm. running. What makes him start running? Well, of course, as you know, these are finely tuned athletes, and uh, <laughs> you have to anticipate anticipate your opponent's move. And if he's on the move into the ropes, then I'm going to go into business for myself, and I'm going to beat him at his own game, and I'm going to come off the ropes, and I'm going to befuddle him as he tries to do something to me. You know, trying to do the kayfabe game is so stupid because these guys are so full of shit. <laughs> the stuff they have to make up stuff for, you know, like what? I mean, I saw something. There was an article. There used to be a thing called the Tropic Magazine that came with the Miami Herald, and they did this huge feature on championship wrestling from Florida. And I remember they asked Gordon Soley, like, um, you know, is the guy's success determined on his gimmick? And Gordon Soley goes, we don't use that word gimmick. <laughs> 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 we don't use that word gimmick. Oh, my God. And it's like, um, but they said in the article, they said, all right, but if it's during a championship match and only the champions make money and everybody wants to win and you want the winner's purse, when you get a guy in a hammerlock, why don't you just apply pressure until the guy gives up or you rip his arm off? You know, because if you were, the, the, was there an he, answer Did Gordon say anything? No, but that was the question posed by the. I mean, I think it was rhetorical, like in the article. You know, like you know, if it was really on the up and up, because what kid wrestling with his friends? I happen to have invented the counter for the hammerlock in my life. Oh, really? I can counter the hammerlock from anyone. I'll demonstrate that at the 605 convention. I'll get in the yeah. middle of a ring and I'll I'll defy anybody, Sergeant Slaughter style. <laughs> <laughs> to apply a hammerlock to me and escape my counter. Well, you know, if you're going to do the hammerlock challenge, you know what song you have to play while you do it, right? What's that? <laughs> do the hammerlock. I do the hammerlock. <laughs> do the hammerlock, you turkey necks. Right? What, what song uh, put hammerlock on the uh, map like this one did? Somewhere out there, Carmine Desperado is popping big time. For turkey neck? He's a big Crusher fan. <laughs> well, who is it? Where were you with the Crusher team with the Bruiser? You know what? <laughs> we got a big reaction to your uh, Bob Luce impression on the Star Wars show. Let me tell you something. At the next round table, <laughs> at the next Star Wars, I want to set up a round table between it's going to be Dom Valenti, Bob Luce, and Tom Carvel. Let me tell you something. I may have to start calling Dom Valenti's show, at least on the next Star Wars, and I'm I'm considering getting it to the top ten because I enjoyed it so much. So good. I thought I was having a, a um out of body experience when he said Marsha Clark. I'm like, what? Did I just fall asleep and wake up in the middle of something? Like what? Marsha? He's talking about wrestling, and all of a sudden it's like Marsha Clark, <laughs> fifty two years old. And by the way, Marsha Clark, for all that plastic surgery she had, she can't remove that chocolate chip from her upper lip. <laughs> that would have been the first thing that I went to the plastic <laughs> surgeon for. What the hell? I've dumped girls for so much less. I think, that's why, I, think, I think that's why OJ got off, actually. Oh, my God. I wouldn't have gotten off. <laughs> Not with Martha Clark, Marsha Clark. That's all right. She didn't need to. Christopher Darden uh, took care of that for her. But, uh, you know, it's funny with the New York hotline scene. It's been so long since I thought about it. But I was involved with that. My my buddy Mad Al had a big show that was very popular. Big show. Big answering machine service here in New York that was very popular. <laughs> ben Lagerstrom was one of the first. I think Ben may have actually been the first one to do it in New York. He got one of these answering machine services, and then everyone copied him. And then Ben, ben also had a reputation for – he never did it to me, but everyone would tell me he ripped them off or he took off with money or he <laughs> screwed them on this and that. He had a thing he was selling for a while. If you look at old observers, you can see it sometimes. Like, send $5 to Ben Lagerstrom and find out how to build your own ring. And get, huh. like, a, get like, a piece of paper folded over. Like, go to the hardware store and buy all this. It's like, I'm not buying lumber. Like, get the fuck uh. out of here. Like, I'm not building a ring. But Ben was uh, the first one, I think, to have one of the hotlines. And then Dominic started up after that, and they were friends. Maybe one of the most unheralded wrestling scenes that anyone's ever uh, yeah. not talked about. The New York well, you know, like the scene. The 900 numbers were huge back then. That was like the thing before the internet. That was like the biggest scam going, you know, like yeah. have your own 900 number and just carve out your own niche. That's why Coach Kurt was so amazing when I discovered that. It was a quarter. It was you can go to a payphone, put in a quarter called 9761111 in New York and get, I don't know, maybe a minute, maybe, you know, now that I think about it, I don't know. Maybe it was shorter than I think. No, it couldn't have been saying an intro. 
let's say a minute to 90 seconds wrestling update every single day. Hmm. So, I mean, that's why it was so great. It was a quarter. Instead of having to call the, the 900 numbers and sit through all the garbage and get nothing. Yeah. You can call him and actually get what would be in the Observer. That would have been quite the scam. Just read the Observer out loud for a dollar a minute. Well, how many <laughs> newsletters popped up that would get the Observer and then just repeat everything they saw in the Observer? Yeah. Well, see, I only got the Observer and I got the Torch for a while. Um, not the Torch. You know the I, Torch was always uniquely different than the Observer. That's yeah, not yeah. Well, that's why I got it because it de- it definitely did give different content. Um, I don't know what it was about it that I liked because I haven't. Um, I haven't seen it in quite a while, but uh, I always enjoyed the torch. Like they had interviews and stuff, and you could get stuff out of it that you didn't get out of the Observer. So they complemented each other. Yeah, especially the early days of the torch. Like up until like ninety three, the torch was like really like especially like ninety nineteen ninety nineteen ninety one when you had like just so many different voices in there, and it didn't look so professional attempting yet. You know, I think yeah. I, think, I think there were always journalistic uh, desires that. Wade Keller had, and that's probably the really the wrong way of putting it, but I, I think he was always trying to do that, but back then it was just such a, so many different voices in there. It was really, really cool. He put out really cool annuals and yearbooks for a while there, and then, I don't know, I think like once, that last great crew was like Madden, Bruce Mitchell, Chris Zavisa, and I don't even know if I'm remembering uh, if there was another person, but once like Madden and Zavisa left the torch, I think that was the end of the torch's golden period. Yeah, I, um, it was probably around 91 ish that I was frequenting them. But back to my list, if I may, because it is oh, yeah. quite amazing. Two out of three falls matches. This is like stuff that exposes the business. Two out of three falls matches, very rare, but I saw a few in my day. And that's the only time that you're going to see a guy's finisher actually work. I saw Dory Funk beat Harley Race with a figure four, with a spinning toehold. The only time the spinning toehold has ever won a match for the Funks. Except when he won the belt, of course. But you know what I mean? Like, well, how about Flair? Every- how many times did Flair get sent to the rope, do the flip over the rope, run to the other side, and then jump doing who knows what and get punched in the stomach? Every time, right? You always thinking- if he's a heel, he comes out on the loser of that. If he's a face, he's going to connect with the axe handle and, and no. win the spot. If he's know? a face, he wins the world title. He actually won the world title coming off the top. Right. Of the- win Correct, a yeah. Vader, right? Uh, and Harley Race. A match I've never liked. I know other people do. I hate the Starcade 83 main event. And I think Gene Kaniski may be the single worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That match did not time. hold up. Yeah, no. yeah. I, and even the no, cross body. Did, like, Flair, like, got him with his legs. Like, it just looks yeah, so Yeah, yeah. Not only did it not hold up, I didn't think that was a great match. I thought that was very slow-paced. And I didn't think that was that spectacular of a match. And um, one thing I noticed about the commentary of that entire card was Gordon was, like, carrying Bob Caudle something terrible. Because Gordon Soley was being Gordon Soley, and then whatever Gordon Soley said something, he'd be like, and of course uh, the assassins are double tough individuals, and Bob Cottle would go, yeah, they sure are, Gordon, they're double tough. <laughs> you, I defy anyone to watch that Starcade show. That's exactly the dynamic those two guys had during the entire match. During the, during the entire show, you know, Gordon would say something and Bob Connell would just repeat it like he was going to add something to it and go, that's exactly right, Gordon. He is a, quite a competitor. I remember when I first saw it and I knew a lot about wrestling by this point. I was young still, but I knew a lot about wrestling. I knew who guys were. I'd seen the magazines. I'd seen pictures and the dog collar match and the flare victory celebration. There are guys in the ring in suits helping the wrestlers who I never <laughs> knew. I was like, who the fuck is that? I've never yeah. seen this guy before. He's Roddy Piper's second. You know, yeah, the same yeah. thing. Flair wins the title. I mean, yeah, I understand Mosk is in there. Yeah, I understand. By the way, Mosk may have celebrated a little too much. Yeah. I understand that Ricky Steamboat's in there. Like, all of a sudden, whoever, Vinny Valentino or yeah. <laughs> Rick McCord. I, actually, I thought it was odd that Mosk was celebrating. Like, why is he so happy that Ric Flair is winning the world title? Like, what does he have invested in this, you know? He probably thought Flair was going to get the book. He's like, watch uh, this. I'll be in the main event uh, in six months. <laughs> Man. And of course, that's, I mean, they say that's what caused Dusty to finally say, yeah, I'm coming up. I'm going to leave Florida. Do you remember oh, when wow. Dusty left, what it was like? I think I left before Dusty, actually, because I went away to college in like the middle of 84. So I was, uh, when I left, Dusty was on top. He was working Jim Duggan in the last match that I ever shot oh, wow. uh, at the Miami Beach Convention Center. So I left before Dusty did. And then coming like the end of 84, whenever he went up there, that was, that was it. And then I stopped watching for a couple of years because um, I was up in Gainesville, University of Florida, 
And for whatever reason, I just didn't pay attention to it as much. But yeah, so Dusty was still there when I was there. But when Dusty left, I mean, there was a lot missing. There was a big hole to fill. And by 86, Florida was quite pathetic in 87, you know? Yeah. You know, I feel bad about it. And it's probably not as bad as I remember it. But like by the beginning of 85, when you have like Jesse Barr feuding with Brian Blair. And Mm. I just, I don't enjoy Florida anymore Mm -hmm. at that point. I'll be honest. I think the last period of Florida I really love is... Right, right around the time Dory Funk Jr. left as the booker in 82. I would have to say that you are completely correct. I might cut it a little earlier and call it 1980. Really? Because eight, 81, you had Eric Embry, Bugsy McGraw, Flair and Wahoo were here. So that was when Flair won the belt and Flair would work. Mike Graham, Wahoo, Mr. Wrestling 2 in 81, 82. And that was great stuff. But the undercard in 81, 82 did not match up to 1980, 79, and everything that came before that. The only reason I happen to have a photographic memory for this is because I literally was photographing it. And so I can draw from my just memories of my photos. And like it became, you know, Eddie Mansfield and Jerry Briscoe were feuding for the junior belt around 81. Charlie Cook was getting a push and he got a world title match in 82 against Harley Race. Or no, again, 81 against, or maybe it was 80 against race, which I never understood Charlie Cook. I understand that, you know, every territory had to have a black guy at that point, but come on, Charlie Cook. He's better than Ron Slinker and Tyree Pride. Right. I mean, exactly. I mean, I that's judge, the period I can't watch at all. I yeah, can't yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Uh, you know, as we know, I'm buddies with Tyree and everything, but um, yeah, that was not championship wrestling from Florida. That was just fumes. I mean, it was like, it was sad said for them um was there anything they could have done to stay alive longer after eddie died nah because you know as you say the people we had down here were like a rehash of kevin sullivan and he was you know his his army was like kind of played out by then and they were turning blackjack they were turning him face and he was teaming up with blackjack like around 86 or 87 and then bugsy mcgraw came back They were sucking on fumes back then because, I mean, Dusty was really the straw that stirred the drink back then for Florida. And when he left, I think that that took all the juice with it. And I don't know, even if Barry Windham and Lex Luger might have stayed, that might have been something, even though Luger completely sucked back then and, you know, forever. But Windham Windham was always great. Not forever. Oh, come on. What's your favorite? I'm one of the people that believe that Lex Luger was actually competent and, in fact, good. You're the one. From about, not as many of us, uh, we we have meetings. (laughs) Uh, From about 1988 until 1991, I would say Lex Luger was actually very, very good. In 1989, he was excellent. Huh. I will say, I saw him work work a long match with Rick Steiner in 89 uh, at the Knight Center for WCW. Uh, I was shooting that ringside. And then the best match I've ever seen Luger or Sting involved in was Luger and Sting against the Steiners at Super Brawl 1 Great match. in 90, 91. Oh, my God. I was there live, and I couldn't believe it. It was like a Japan match. Constant action. Couldn't ask for anything more. And I'm like, wow, the Steiners really – Drag something out of Sting and Luger that night. It was a great match. It was a good decision never putting those four guys in the ring again. <laughs> Ever. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why. No, they they should have done something because that was good. That was Japan-level stuff right there. I've got to say, I've never seen Luger or Sting involved in a decent match prior or after that. Oh, come on. You can't say. I mean, what about Sting what and would Flair? You, what, would you, what would you point to a great um, Luger match? Luger Steamboat. Bash eighty nine, glory days. Hmm. I'll tell you what, I'll give you I'll give you one that's really good also. Luger and Tommy Rich, nineteen eighty nine. I think it was the clash hmm. in September of eighty nine. I could be wrong. Now you wouldn't think, oh, Tommy Rich, nineteen eighty nine, although he did have a little bit of a career renaissance for a brief period of time there, but that's actually a really good match. Think about the matches Luger had in eighty nine. Wyndham, Steamboat, a uh, Michael Hayes. He he got better matches out of Michael Hayes. Really? Then, then he had any right to. Uh, Brian Pillman, Flying Brian. And then, you know, he has the big heel turn uh, during that year. And then you go into 1990, they immediately turn him back babyface. He has a great match with Flair. He has the series with Stan Hansen. I will say Lex Luger from, if we're going to be fair, from mid-88 on, because that's around the time he has the match with Flair at the Bash in Baltimore, until 
let's say 91 until around the time he gets the belt Luger, or even if you want to end it earlier and say the end of 1990 Luger actually has at least a two-year period where he was really good hmm I am going to have to do some due diligence and check out some tapes and get back to you on that because Luger is kind of listening to Stairway to Heaven for me, which is, you know, you've already seen it and you just tune out. And I I never paid much attention to him. I'm just like, Sting and Luger suck. I'm not going to pay them attention. They were always like a sandwich match for me. I'm like, I'll see you in a minute. And I never paid those guys any never mind. But out of deference to you, I will check that out. I will go back into the archives and uh, I'll see I'll see what the deal is. But, I mean, you know, Luger, when I think of Luger, I think of him pulling up his trunks and breathing heavily. Always grabbing and, uh, his dick in the, in the ring. Someone told me that a few years ago, and now it's like all you, you see when you watch him. He's always grabbing his dick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was he was always so stiff, and I don't mean in a good way. It just, it just looked like he didn't belong in there, and he's like, whoa. And he's like breathing and pulling up his trunks and just – he was so stiff to me. He didn't move like a wrestler. It's not like – you know, like imagine Lex Luger in there. My, my kind of um, litmus test is you picture a Sting or a Lex Luger. And like you, you say to yourself, what would they do in there with a Jack Briscoe? Would it be a wrestling match? What would they do? Yeah, you know – and I, I don't see it. I don't see it for those guys. Like, that's what I think professional wrestling is, is like a Jack Briscoe match. Like, what would Jack Briscoe do with this guy? What would Jack Briscoe do with a Lex Luger? He wouldn't know what the fuck to do. Jack Briscoe would do a go-behind, and Lex Luger would stand there breathing heavy. I've never thought but, about the uh, Lex Luger-Jack Briscoe dream match, so I can't really answer that firmly right yeah. now. But I'll tell you what, Howard, we do have to move along pretty soon. Did you have anything else left on your list of uh, whatever it I'll was? Hit, I'll hit these quick. Things that expose the business. Hitting someone with a deadly weapon. I first saw this like in a um, going way back, like Sweet Brown Sugar grabbed Kendo Nagasaki's kendo stick and he's killing everyone with it. And I'm like, well, if this was if it was really poking this guy in the gut and 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 hitting him over the head with this, like he would kill him. Now, of course, you have Triple H hitting guys with bats and everything else. Sledgehammer. Like, these guys, he hits them. Yeah, with yeah, a oh, exactly, exactly. Right, 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 right. Stings bat and, and Triple H's <laughs> sledgehammer. Like, come on, these guys would be completely dead ten times over. Guys who came into a territory and changed identities. Mark Lewin comes back. All of a sudden, he's this freak that comes out of the sea. He was Mark Lewin. He was here. He was a baby <laughs> face. And now no one ever heard of Mark Lewin? Like, why do they do that? You want to pretend it's real, but you bring a guy back, and he has a completely different identity. Memphis at least had the dignity to put a guy under a hood. You know, bring him back as a medic or a whatever. Um, no acknowledgement of past history or feuds. Memphis, again, was really good in this area. Like, if somebody had a a bad past with Jerry Lawler, they'd go, well, you know, Austin Idol used to feud with Lawler, but Lawler can't really trust them, and now he's going to have this match because there's there's one guy they hate more than each other, and that's Jimmy Hart or whatever. Acknowledge the past feuds. How do you have a guy leave a territory, come back, and all of a sudden, like, this is Dusty Rhodes' friend. Dusty used to feud with Blackjack Mulligan. Then they used to bring Mulligan in as a baby face, and like that was never acknowledged. And I'm like, he had this big match with them at the Bayfront, and they hated each other. And my biggest pet peeve about this, and this is the last one, is these guys want to kill each other. They give the, the classic interview, like, I don't care where it is, cameraman, zoom in close. I don't care where I see you, if it's the Kmart, the little general. I don't care if you're with your kids. I don't care if I'm with my old lady, but I'm going to get you, you motherfucker. Then they get in the ring... And the heels are doing something to a baby face. Somebody's like making Scott McGee froth at the mouth. And Barry Windham will jump in there to save the guy from Kevin Sullivan or something. But all Kevin Sullivan has to do is leave the ring. And Barry Windham has a chair or something. And he swings at him once impotently. He's like, oh, I didn't get him. So I guess I got to wait until tonight in Miami because there's no way I'm going to leave the ring and actually chase him. I never got that at all. Like, I want to kill you, but I'm not going to leave the ring. See, that was That's the great thing about Memphis. Memphis was the one studio wrestling show where there were actually chases mm-hmm. in the studio. Guys got chased out of the studio. Guys yeah. ran legit. You could tell they shoot running out of the studio. Jimmy Hart, Bill Dundee, Jim Cornette. Yeah. Do you remember the one up there where um, Jerry Law, it, it precipitated the biggest bench clearing brawl you ever saw in Memphis. And um, Jerry Lawler was out there. I think it was after one of his comebacks. It might have been his comeback from the broken leg, like where he came back, and Jimmy Hart was out there with his whole family. And J- and Jerry Lawler goes, I'm going to tell you something, you little piece of shit, or whatever he called him back then. He's like, you little idiot. Let me just tell you something. 
if I ever see you, I'm going to kick your ass starting right now. And he attacked him. <laughs> and everybody on the whole entire Memphis wrestling roster came out there. It was the biggest, most prolonged brawl you ever saw. I love that kind of shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really, really do. But with that, we will move along now. Uh, we have an interesting segment here. This segment of the Super Podcast is brought to you by our friends, the wrestling fans over at Ramsor Records. And Howard, Ramsor is an artist they really can't wait to tell everyone about this week. And that is Sammy Miller and the congregation. Ramsor Records proud to welcome a band on a mission to put the generosity back into jazz and bring art back to the people. Sammy Miller and the congregation. A native of Los Angeles, Grammy-nominated drummer Sammy Miller has become known for his relentless focus on making music that feels good as a drummer, singer, and band leader. Upon completing his master's at Juilliard, Sammy formed his ensemble, The Congregation. While independently, the band members have performed and recorded with notable artists including Wynton Marsalis, Lady Gaga, and Queen Latifah at venues including the White House, Lincoln Center, and the Hollywood Bowl. Wow. They have opted to stick together and spread their joy throughout the world. As a band, they share the power of community through their music. Joyful jazz. Music that feels good. A style that entertains, enriches, and most of all, uplifts. They are on tour nationally right now. Sammy Miller and the Congregation. Check them out. SammyMillerCongregation.com for upcoming tour dates and to find out more information about the band. And of course, they are also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Sammy Miller and the Congregation, another fine musical act brought to you from our friends, the wrestling fans over at Ramsour Records, R-A-M-S-E-U-R, Ramsour Records. I bet the name Tim Tyler would mean something to you, as well as many other fans of ICW, International Championship Wrestling, because Tim Tyler was the television commentator for the Pafos for the run of ICW, and I'm very happy to say that I had a chance to talk to him and you'll hear that in a second. I want to give special thanks to Joe Stasi. He runs an ICW Facebook group, and he put us in touch. Joe, thank you. I appreciate it, as always. Friend of the show, Joe Stasi. But with that, let's now go to my conversation with longtime ICW television commentator, Tim Tyler. I would like to welcome to the Super Podcast, Tim Tyler. And it's because we're going to talk about Happy's Place. For the next hour. No, no, no. I kid, I kid, I kid. But Tim, welcome to the show. We're going to talk ICW, and we're going to talk today about the Poffos. Thank you so much, Brian. Well, let's go back. You know, I asked you briefly before we started recording, when did you first discover wrestling? When did you first see wrestling? What are your earliest impressions of it? When I was, uh, you know, uh, a, a mere child back in the black and white days of television, uh, I would watch it with my dad, and there was a a local group uh, here in the Ashland, Kentucky area uh, that wrestled. And uh, when any of them appeared on TV, I thought it was kind of neat that, you know, they were actually people that lived in Ashland. And it kind of made it all very real for me. And, and I always, you know, of course, had the assumption that it was real and there was, you know, nothing going on behind the scenes. And I could imagine people taking that physical punishment and, and you know, and, and feeling good about it, so to speak. Do you remember which wrestlers you saw, which wrestlers stood out, especially the local ones that you said uh, you had always noticed? The Scuffling Hillbillies was a tag team that uh, was on the air. And I'm trying to think of some individual names. Um, none are coming to mind at, at the moment. I guess let's get away from wrestling for a second, and let's give a little bit of your background. To the listeners out there who aren't familiar with you, before we even get to any of the wrestling stuff, give a little bit about your background and where you were when you first interacted with the Pafos and ICW. Okay, I was uh, working at WTVQ-TV in Lexington. Uh, I was kind of a jack of all trades there uh, in the uh, late 70s and uh, early uh, 80s. And uh, one day, uh, Randy and uh, his dad, um, Angelo, uh, came to the station and uh, talked to the sales department and the programming department about wanting to uh, produce their show uh, at our facility and they had someone that was going to be their announcer he lived in somerset kentucky which was a uh kind of a far drive from lexington and he started out doing the show and i actually ran audio uh on those uh early stages of the programming and interacted uh, because randy was the you know producer 
and and director, so to speak. And he sometimes would stay in the control room with us during the actual show and tell the director, you know, what was going to come next, what one wrestler was going to do to the other, what camera angles to have. Huh. So I sort of met them that way. Then when that announcer decided that driving from Somerset was too much of a problem for him, Randy asked me, did I want to do it? And I said, you know, Randy, I've never done anything exactly like that, but sure, I'll, I will I would he said, well, no, you know, I'll, I'll teach you everything you need to know, and, you know, this will, this will be good. So, at that point in time, when Randy approaches you to fill in as the commentator, were you paying attention to the program? Were you following it? Were you aware of all the storylines and who the individual wrestlers were? Yes, I was, because Randy always had a very small notebook he kept with him, and he had, like, months in advance what was going to happen. And he knew, you know, like the next move somebody was going to make, if that would affect something months down the line. And he had it all choreographed so well. It, it amazed me that his mind was so clever in, in, in doing that. I said, you know, that's, he should be a soap opera uh, writer. Because his story and I think say, would, would go months in advance. And then some of the guys would get confused, and he would have to say, you know, no, you've got to do so-and-so, and you've got to say so-and-so now. And because, you know, a month from now, this is going to happen because you said that today. So he had to keep all of them on their toes constantly. Even back then, Randy had a bigger-than-life personality, and Angelo was a star in his own right. What was your first impression of both of them? Okay, when when I decided I wanted to do do it, and he said, we, we pay in cash, I said, that's fine. So at that point, Angelo had not wrestled as, as the miser on any of the shows yet. He just kind of stayed behind the scenes. So the first time they went to pay me, they said, you need to walk out into the parking lot with us. I said, okay. And they had parked their car behind the station, and Angelo had a gold-colored Mercedes sedan, and he said, just a minute, and he popped the trunk, and I looked in there, and it looked like the Bank of America in there. <laughs> the amount of money was staggering that I saw in that trunk. And he looked at me, and he said, the miser knows that money's the most important thing in the world. And I looked at him like, what? <laughs> what, what does that mean? You know, and they reached in and, and, you know, handed me out my money. He said, we pay all of our guys in cash also. I said, you know, don't you ever worry about somebody doing something to this car? He goes, no, they know whose car it is, and they know what would happen if they even touched it. I said, okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean it was in the trunk? I mean, was it just loose bills? They had it in, or... they had it in bills in the trunk, and they had, you know, like rubber bands around it and things, <laughs> and they had it all laid out in denominations. So it looked like, like a huge cash drawer. <laughs> And obviously, you had never been paid for anything in your life in that manner. Not in, not in that manner, no. <laughs> <laughs> and going forward, working with them uh, through the TV station, would you continue to be paid in that manner? Yes. Every time they, they came out and recorded the show, I would go out back, and that was it, yeah. You mentioned Randy and Angelo. Was Lanny very involved in the inner workings from what you saw? Not at, not at first, he wasn't. He sort of this, you know, he was the, the quiet one of the family, is the way I would describe him. In fact, when I when I had the chance to talk with Randy's uh, mother, she described Lanny as, as a quiet one in a family, and Randy was just nuts, is what she said. That was the term she used. <laughs> so, uh, but as, as it progressed, you know, Lanny had a, had a bigger role in it. And they never did really, you know, let on like they were brothers. That was, you know, that was known, but they never played it as such. They, they, they never mentioned it or anything. What did WTVQ, what did the executives there think of having wrestling in the studios and having these wrestlers around? They, well, they liked, you know, getting the money for the production. The last thing we did live television-wise was uh, at 8.30 in the morning. We had a, had a five-minute newscaster between... 8.25 and 8.30, then Good Morning America uh, kept on going. And as soon as 8.30 came, they would start bringing in the ring and bringing in the chairs and uh, assemble it all, and we'd rearrange the cameras. And we knew that we had to be done by 11.30 because we had to start getting ready for the noon news. So they had it down to a science of putting the ring up and assembling everything and that big banner that they had. 
uh, you know, you know well oiled machine in, in putting things up and taking them down. They had a crew just to do that. Angelo paid for the production. Do you know how much he paid? Don't recall. I was never in on any of uh, what that was, but, you know, but the station, you know, felt it was certainly worth their while to uh, to let it happen. Of course, it all, all the outside audience would just hear by word of mouth that they were going to be there on such and such a date, and they always knew we started about 9 a.m. So they would be like milling around outside in, in, in the front parking lot. Uh, the station didn't really want them coming in and you know laying around the uh, lobby or anything. So uh, when when the time came for them to come in, you know, they opened up the front door and ushered them right uh, directly to the studio. At that time at WTVQ, how much local programming was being produced? Besides the news and uh, some religious shows for playback on Sunday morning, uh, that was the only other other program. So when you first start commentating over wrestling, what are some of the early moments that happen in front of the camera that you remember? Some of the things that really stand out, the crazier moments. Okay, well, as as we went on, we I, I got a, uh, a second guy with me. His name was Edgar Wallace. At that time, he was a member of the uh, Lexington Fayette Urban County Council, so he was very well known around town. Uh, he was an attorney, and I can't believe you know, that he wanted to do it, but he had some, you know, interest in doing it. And Randy had, had talked to him, and so they they would, you know, he would sit beside me. Uh, some of my earlier memories about the matches was um, Ronnie Garvin and Pez Watley were always so very entertaining. Sometimes the, what we would do is say on Tuesday mornings they would come out and we would shoot all the promos that they would use in various other markets. And I remember Randy, you know, telling them that say in uh, in Springfield or in, in Johnson City, Tennessee, this hasn't happened yet. So you you know this promo is kind of behind times, but but that show hadn't been seen there yet because they would you know we would record it. Uh, and then they would ask for various copies of that show that they would send them out to the, to the stations to to play back on. But Pez was great in the promos, and so was Ronnie Garvin. Those promo sessions were so entertaining. Sometimes they're almost better than the uh, the show itself because they were they were unscripted sometimes, and they would just let loose and and uh, come up with some very very funny things. Speaking of those interviews, Randy Savage did very memorable interviews, so I'm curious, well, yeah. how would you compare Randy Savage off-camera to Randy Savage that fans would see on camera? Randy was very soft-spoken off-camera. He didn't, you know, he didn't yell or scream. Very well-spoken, you know, just very, you know, very mannerly. <laughs> Some of the funnier things I just thought of, uh, he called me up one time and said, come over to my house. I said, okay. He lived about to a mile from where I lived, so I drove over. And when I got out of the car, I noticed it was just a very nice neighborhood in Lexington, a nice house. There was aluminum foil over every window that I could see in that house. So I rang the doorbell. He came to the door. I said, Randy, let me ask you, why is there aluminum foil on your windows? He said, I want my neighbors to think I'm crazy. Well, I'm sure they think you're strange, if nothing else. And that's, you know, he's always worried about his image. And then there was a time that he called up and said, I've got to tell you this before I do it. I said, what? He said, I'm going to go to Kroger's and I'm going to steal one steak and I'm going to put it in my pants halfway down so the top half can be seen and they'll catch me. I said, and why are you going to do that? He said, you know, it'll be in a paper that I did that. And it really helped my image. Wow. It so was in the paper. Yeah. And they used a, they used that on the show, you know, like Randy got caught stealing a piece of steak. That he's, you know, he's crazy. He, why did he do all the money he has and his million dollar robes? You know, <laughs> why would he need to steal a steak? <laughs> so, See, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you guys used it on the show. We actually mentioned that. And then another time he called me, he said, you got to come over. I'm going to see a movie. So, okay. Went over, sat down. He had not one, but two VCRs 
And in, in 1980, that was kind of highly unusual oh, yeah. and expensive for someone to have two of them. Yeah. So he, he fired up this movie. We watched the entire movie. He didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. At the very end, he said, what do you think? I said, about who? He goes, that big guy. I said, the guy, the, the big ball headed guy, yeah. He said, that's Ox Baker. I said, okay. He said, I'm bringing him on. What do you think? I said, okay. <laughs> so, so the next week, <laughs> here comes Ox Baker out. And Ox, Ox is bigger than life, too. Yeah, that was yeah. a big guy. Big guy. And that voice. Yeah. And then, the, uh, I don't know if you know about the famous match where Ronnie Garvin knocked out Ox's false teeth and then stomped on him. Yeah, what was that like sitting there while that was happening? Oh, that was that was that was <laughs> crazy because I didn't know that was. They didn't tell me that was going to happen. How much did they I clue you in on in general? How much before you went out there to broadcast the show? How much were you? I knew. On? Okay, I knew who was going to win, but I sometimes didn't know how it was going to happen because I guess they wanted my my you know reaction to what was going on. They wouldn't tell me in any of the moves that were going to happen, but I knew. Just for strip wise, who was going to uh, end up being the the winner? But it was always entertaining. Figure out, you know, like they got going. I said to myself, you know, how how is he going to win because he's doing so bad right now? And then they would, you know, turn it around, and the one that they wanted to win would would win. But the the tea thing was absolutely crazy. I had no idea that was going to happen, and I uh, I thought that was one of the crazier things I'd seen. In a long time, and they they milked that for everything they could for you know for weeks in the show. They kept talking about Ox's teeth. One angle that people still talk about to this day is Pez Watley in a bra and panties <laughs> as yeah. Miss Macho Man, nineteen eighty one. Tell me about that day. What did you know that was going to happen before it happened? And what do you remember about all that? Okay, we had a back entrance to the studio that had actually had a garage door and everything. They brought in that box that Pez ended up in and put it together because it was so big they couldn't didn't have a truck that big, but they put it together. Then they wrote all that stuff on the side of it. And Who's that? Told me, you know, what was, uh, Randy and, and Angelo. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> I said, okay. I'm just picturing them with the spray paint yeah. cans, spray painting on the right. box. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They did. They didn't tell me what Pez was going to have on though. <laughs> that was a, that was a surprise. So the box was, you know, it almost was bigger than they thought it was going to be, and they tried to figure out how they were going to, you know, get push it in in past the garage area into to the actual studio. So they got enough guys to do that. And then when, when, of course, when, you know, you hear knocking on the inside and everything and nobody knew what was in there. And then when they got it open and, and Pez came out, uh, I remember Edgar that was doing the show with me. He really thought that was funny. And I started laughing so much I could hardly control myself. We, we talked about that for years. That was, that was a real highlight. Crusher Broomfield was involved in that. And he would, of course, later gain fame as the one man gang, as well as Akeem. What do you remember about right. a young Crusher Broomfield? I remember how big he was. I remember one time he sat down in a uh, metal folding chair and it collapsed. He was so big. And Randy just looked at him and said, don't sit down anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Good solution, I guess. Yeah. Uh, another person that I always remember was uh, Ernie Ladd. Yeah, the big cat. Him, the first time he was there, him and Randy were doing a promo. So Randy was going and ranting and raving, and Ernie just looked at him. It didn't say a word until the very, like, five seconds left, and, and Ernie just turned toward Randy and said, call somebody. <laughs> and Randy looked at him and said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was, <laughs> that's how he, <laughs> then he said, Ernie, why didn't you say anything? He said, I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about Thunderbolt Patterson? Don't remember too much about his personality. I, you know, I remember him wrestling, but uh, didn't have that much interaction with him. Ronnie Garvin was to, to me. Ronnie Garvin was always like the second in, in, in command of that organization. He did a lot of the planning with Randy, and sometimes he would come up with stuff 
it, we had like a meeting before we actually started uh, recording, and you know sometimes he would make minor adjustments as to what was going to to happen. And Ronnie was a a, a great guy, really great guy, a nice guy. Uh, he invited me down to his. Uh, he had lived near Knoxville, Tennessee, then, and he had a boat, and I think he even flew an airplane. So he he was a he was a great guy. There was a little person wrestler who was around ICW, and people still talk about some of the angles he was involved in, named Wee Willie Wilson. Do you remember Wee Willie? I don't think he ever actually wrestled on the recorded shows, but he came with them several times. I think, yeah, he didn't. He was just part of the audience at that, at that point. They sometimes would, would actually they would bring people that they wanted to put in the audience for some reason and kind of plant them in there to yell at a certain time. And Oh, really? So thought, some of that crowd yeah. in the ICW TV shows was planted? Yeah. I don't know what the reasoning behind it was, uh, because when Randy was sitting with the director, he would say, take a shot of so-and-so's face in the audience. And they, they knew when to react a certain way when a certain move happened, and then Randy wanted a shot of their face reacting to it. Wow, that's so interesting. I never would have thought that, they had planted fans. That's fascinating. Yeah. I uh, remembered some names of local wrestlers here. There was one called Rip Collins and a guy named Clarence Gray. Rip was uh, like the local star, so to speak. And I don't know what organization they were wrestling for. don't know what the name was. Right. That was years earlier than ICW. So I would Big have to... time wrestling. Big time wrestling. Back to ICW, I'm, I'm curious... Obviously, there was a big promotional rivalry between ICW and the Pafos and Jerry Lawler, Jerry Jarrett, the Memphis-based right. wrestling company. Uh -huh. What do you remember about that? Because it's something that wrestling fans to this day talk about, this promotional feud where there were challenges issued on air. There were occurrences where guys showed up. I know Randy showed up at uh, the arena in Lexington when they started running there in his backyard. There was the incident with him and Bill Dundee. What do you remember about all that, that feud between the two companies? I remember Randy Dion not speaking well of them, and he said that he would like to put them out of business. Was his, you know, he said, we, we need to put them out of business. We need to do better than they do, and uh, they don't deserve the attention they're getting. But, you know, none of them ever showed up at uh, any of our uh, recordings. He... I had a lot of discouraging words about Lawler, but, you know, nothing ever became of it. He said, you know, I'm going to get him. He's, he's cutting into our business. It was a relatively small company. Did they always seem optimistic to you? Did they always seem like they thought things Oh, were... yeah. Okay. Well, Randy, you know, Randy said to me point blank, he says, I will be in Madison Square Garden someday. And I said, well, you know, Randy, I certainly hope you do. Uh, they had big hopes for it. They they really did. If if they had had uh, better financial backing, I think you know they could have really come out with it. Did they have any financial backing that you know of beyond the actual wrestlers who were partners? Not that I know of. It no, no. They and sometimes they were t you know talking me how they would travel all night between you know between shows. They'd be you know in in Illinois somewhere. And then the next day they had to be in Johnson City, Tennessee, and how they would you know ride all night and sleep in the car and and <laughs> you know they were they were determined to make something out of it, and they certainly wanted to pay their dues. I want to bring up some other names that people think about when they think about i c w one of them would be George Weingroff. george they you know presented him almost as as the head of it. He was the the face of it, so to speak. When he wasn't, you know, actually uh, wrestling, he was a very nice guy, very well spoken. Uh, wasn't a bit temperamental at all. They always, you know, he was always the, uh, the the good guy, and he played it very, very straight. What about Rip Rogers? Rip Rogers was a uh, <laughs> <laughs> he. He would get he he put a lot of effort into his promos. He would really, you know, go off and Randy loved that. And like I say, that, the promo time is, you know, was 30 seconds, but it gave them, a, you know, a condensed time to really get it all out. And some of them would just go off 
And Randy kept saying, you know, I wish you could be that way when we're actually recording a show uh, and, you know, let that energy out. He kind of used that to, to build up their energy, so to speak. But Rip was a, uh, he was really good doing the promos is what I remember b- about him. You had been involved in broadcasting for a good deal of time already by this point. Right. What did you think of the improvisational skills the wrestlers exhibited on the promos? Loved it. I actually loved it. It was just because they they had 30 seconds to say something, and sometimes they would just just let loose. Which reminds me, one time we were doing a promo, and I was in it, and the famous Sheik was there. And we were sitting down, and the Sheik was next to me. I, I think it was Randy on the other side, and Randy was doing all the talking. And I looked over. And the sheik had a half of my necktie in his mouth. <laughs> and he kept on and kept on till he was like choking me. And at the very end, Randy just looked over at him. And I couldn't say a word because he had me around the neck with my own tie. <laughs> and then as soon as it was off, everybody laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. And that was the uh, big joke of the week. Randy said, what, what possessed you to do that? He goes, just wanted to. <laughs> What kind of ratings did the show get? Real good. Really, really good. People loved it because they knew Randy was he lived in Lexington, was based in Lexington. And so there again, a, a local star on, on TV that they really could connect with. Because you know, he, you know, he loved to go out in public, go to the mall, and just you know wander around, let people see him. He wouldn't stand off his about that at all. There were different things that I've heard throughout the years about where they were financially, uh, you know, especially towards the end of the company. How were they uh-huh. doing, to the best of your knowledge? After they were on with us for a couple of years, they did run into some financial trouble. And they got the idea that they would go out and just record shows when they were in arenas around their circuit that they made. And so they, you know... They quit us. We didn't quit them because they figured they could save a lot of money by doing it themselves. And that's when they got a hold of Liz Hewitt, who became Miss Elizabeth. She had worked for a cable company in Lexington. And they decided to just air it on cable and not on on, on the air. And that's how she got involved with them. When they stopped doing the TV show on WTVQ, they actually left regular broadcast TV, and they went to cable? Right. Wow, I didn't realize that. When did Lexington get cable? Very late, because all three stations uh, battled it. I would say 82 or 83. It was very, very late in coming, because everybody fought it. The broadcast stations fought it. Were they paid up with the station when they left the station? As far as I know, yeah. If not, I I would have probably heard about it if they hadn't have been. But I, I never heard anything where they were not paid up at all. You had obviously been commentating for several years involved with the company. What are you thinking when all of a sudden you're not doing it? Do you miss it? I'm, I missed it at first. Yeah, I said, you know, but I, you know, I certainly wished them well. And I hoped, you know, that they went on to bigger and better things, which the Randy and Lanny both did. But um, it was it was a great experience, you know, it's, you know, things that I will always remember, and I uh, you know, certainly love to pass on those stories. When Randy became that major star in the World Wrestling Federation, when he did get the main event at Madison Square Garden, did it get a lot of attention in Lexington? Oh, yeah, it really did. People would say, oh, I remember when he was just on TV here. I remember seeing him out at the mall. And now, you know, there he is, you know, biggest life on national television in, in Madison Square Garden. You mentioned the promos. Whenever a promo pops up that hasn't been in circulation, everyone gets very excited. There's still a hunt for more ICW footage. It feels like there's so many gaps, so many holes where the footage is gone. To the best of your knowledge, what happened to any master tapes that there were? Do you know of anyone who may have any footage of ICW that isn't currently out there? It may be. uh, We had an engineer at the station who was very interested in, in wrestling. And he would, he worked at night, and sometimes he would take the 
actual master tape and make copies of it for himself. And when we switched from two inch videotape to one inch videotape and had the better editing capabilities, he would sometimes go back and re edit it and make funny matches just for himself to view. And he may still have some of those. And now, you know, I'll, I'll contact him and see if he does have any. Yeah, please. I mean, you know, that's the thing. It's not just that Randy became such a big star. And of course, Ron Garvin and Lanny and everyone who was there pretty much who was young really went on to have a great career in wrestling, but it's like a lost wrestling history. You know, the the footage out of Memphis is widely seen. It's widely in circulation. But like I said, for the few years that ICW existed, there's so much footage that's just been lost that no one's seen. So many promos that no one's right. seen. So many shows. So it's it's one of those things that wrestling historians and wrestling fans are always looking for. Did you ever hear or see about when the miser did the world set up record i know about when angelo originally did it did he do it as the miser in the studio he sure did <laughs> For some... he... <laughs> and we had him we had him you know video boxed up down in the uh, right hand corner of the screen during the whole show and he did push-ups for an hour and <laughs> And we had a count, we had a counter running too to count the number. And I think he bested his original record. That, that was a surprise on us too. We didn't know that was coming because he said he had to feel a certain way before he could do it. So he one day walked in and said, I'm ready to do this. So, so we did it. <laughs> what other memorable moments do you have from the studio show? Oh, sometimes <laughs> here's, here's a good one. Randy, of course, you know, would, wrestle and he had his outfit on but he also wanted to sit with the director so he couldn't cross through the studio to go in that way so he would run out back run around the building come in through the front door and back to where the director was and sit with him and in his full outfit and then then he knew his match was next and he would run back around and come through the back door again so <laughs> He had a, had a dual role there sometimes, and I don't know how he kept up with himself. It really was a mom-and-pop company, wasn't it? It certainly, certainly was. And I still have memories of, you know, after they paid me and everybody, you know, taking everything away and they're getting ready to leave, of, you know, Angelo driving, Randy sitting in the front seat, and Lanny in the back seat, and that big gold Mercedes just going down the road. Love to have a shot of that, but... That was a that's a memory that I have. What about the dichotomy and the personalities of Randy and Lanny? Lanny was so quiet. It was it was it was strange. One day I had uh, they said, "What's wrong?" I said, "Well, my back kind of hurts." Randy just looked at Lanny and said, "Do it." And Lanny came over to me and picked me up about two feet off the floor and shook me and made my back feel better. Didn't say a word. And put me back down on the floor and walked away. It's almost, you know, Randy had this thing where he could tell Lanny what to do, I think, and, and, and Lanny would do it and didn't question it. He just did what he was told. <laughs> what about Bob Orton Jr.? Remember Bob Orton Jr.? He was kind of had the cowboy thing going on. Uh, remember him wearing that big hat all the time? Yeah, sometimes Randy wouldn't want him to wear the hat in the ring. And he said, no, I want to keep it on. And they would go back and forth about that. Yeah, you know, Randy was a micromanager. He had, had everything down and the way he wanted it. And if they didn't do it, he would he would question it. And I'm, But I do remember the uh, big hat. Did you ever see Randy have a disagreement with one of the other wrestlers about something he wanted them to do? Yeah, he and but he would be real quiet about it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't get up in their face. He wouldn't scream. He was just very stern almost like a school teacher, and said, you know, I want you to do it this way. I have a reason, and we'll talk about the reason later, but just do it and do it now. And they would, you know. <laughs> Who did you feel ran the show more, Angelo or Randy? Randy. I don't know if, if Angelo, you know, was a higher authority and told him what he wanted done, but a Angelo never said much. He, he, to me, was just the financial man, is the way I always saw him as. Well, he was also, at times, your co-commentator. What did you think of doing commentary with the miser? He he was good, because he, he was very old school about it. And, you know, and he, 
I was not at that, some in the early stages, I was unfamiliar with the name of some of the moves. And he would come out and you're like, that's a Russian arm bar. And I think, where's he getting these terms from? Is he <laughs> making them up or is this, is this what it's really called, you know? And then what about Izzy Slapowitz? He's a name that a lot of people remember. Izzy Slapowitz. He was doing a promo one time, and near the end, what he was saying was not making too much sense, but near the end, I always remember, he said, we're through playing around, we're going to start hurting people. And when that was over, Randy goes, that's the greatest thing you ever said, that's perfect. Where did you get that from? Because I don't know, I just said it. So at, at the station, we would say that all the time after that. We would just look at each other and say, we're through playing around, we're going to start hurting people. Did a lot of people at the station talk about wrestling? Oh, yeah. We had all, all of our favorite sayings, and we would just work them into normal conversations. We'd be talking about money, so I'd say, the miser knows the money's the most important thing in the world. <laughs> Everybody's okay. And everybody said, like, oh, yeah, and dig it. Even back then, Randy's lexicon caught on with people. Oh, yeah, definitely. All these years later, what do you think the legacy of ICW is? It was definitely, I guess, almost like it was before its time. It was it was very innovative, very entertaining. Like I said, if they had the financial backing, they could have been the forerunners in the uh, in the wrestling game. Randy had such great, great ideas, and the way he executed the uh, storylines months and months and months in advance, to me, was just pure genius. There he is, Tim Tyler, another fun segment about ICW, and we've had a few here on the show, and they always get a great reaction. I want to thank Tim for spending a few minutes with us here today on the show. And uh, I think we need to do some ICW segments again in the future because I always enjoy doing them. But with that, let's move on to our next segment. I had an opportunity to speak with John Lister, British wrestling historian, about his new book, Have a Good Week, Till Next Week, all about the history of world of sport wrestling. We'll talk a little bit more about it on the other side. It is our book of the week. So we want to make sure you do check that out. But first... Listen to this conversation about British wrestling with John Lister. I am very happy to welcome to the Super Podcast John Lister, British wrestling historian and the author of the new book, Have a Good Week, Till Next Week, British Wrestlers of the TV Era. John, welcome to the Super Podcast. Great to be here. You know, before we get going, talking about your book and talking about British wrestling history, you and I are kind of connected in a little bit of a way. We, we talked a little bit about it off air in that the famous story of me bringing a bed sheet from the travel lodge to the ECW arena with the words Bubba must die on it. And we held up. It was so big. They couldn't edit it completely off TV, although they did their very best to try. Yeah, it's amazing to think this is uh, the summer of 1996. And we were sort of there protesting the fact that the, but Bubba Ray Dudley gimmick has outlived its usefulness. It was gone too far. No one wanted to see it anymore. <laughs> 1996. So I bring this sign, this giant bed sheet to the building. Bubba must die. It ends up being maybe, possibly, at least one of the catalysts that lead to Bubba Ray Dudley's heel turn and his heel run. And it turns out you were in the bleachers with me that night and you helped hold up the sign. That's right. I mean, yeah, certainly uh, claim a bit of, of credit for uh, this you know, long heel career. You've had an interesting journey around wrestling. Of course, you're a British wrestling historian. You've written about British wrestling. You've written about wrestling in general. But in terms of your travels outside of England, I I'm very curious when you started traveling to see wrestling and where did you go? Well, that uh, trip in 96, 96 was the first time I'd been abroad to see wrestling, which was just for the ECW convention. And the following year, I made a couple of trips, which was doing you know enormous loops around the country, going to Memphis Television, the Dallas Sportatorium, several sort of WWF pay-per-views, uh, the Terry Funk Retirement Show, which you were also at. Um, then you know, a couple of couple more trips to the States since then, uh, and then made it to Japan this uh, past new year. When did you get to the Dallas Sportatorium and what was that like for you? Well, it was uh, September of 97 and it was uh, certainly not the peak of the Dallas Territory. It was the Confederate Wrestling Organization or Confederate <laughs> Wrestling Alliance, I think. 
Uh, I know Black Bart was on the show. Uh, there was a uh, Mark Von Eric. That was a, a good one. Mark uh, Von Eric. Okay. <laughs> and I think there was about a hundred and eight people in the crowd that night. So it was, uh, yeah, kind of kind of odd to see there, and kind of you could imagine what it was like as a, a full building, but sort of very kind of sad to see it in that state. What was it like going from like the ECW arena to the Dallas Sportatorium, a building that once rocked? Much heavier, much, I mean, the place went crazy for the Von Erichs in the early 80s, and now it was in the state it was in. The fans were in the state they were in, versus the yeah, ECW I mean, was, Arena, which was, at that point in time, next to Karkin Hall in Tokyo, the building to be in. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, the definition of, of diehard fans by then, sort of, you know, testing the theory that people would come along to see absolutely anything. I mean, my favorite bit of that trip was uh, I turned up, you know, an hour or so early to the, the venue because there's nothing else to do. I just arrived on the, the Greyhound bus and there was uh, one of the wrestlers was talking to one of the promoters there and said, is it OK if I go off down to the liquor store? And they said, yeah, yeah, no problem. As long as you're back sort of 10 minutes before your match. So that was kind of, you know, the, the level of dedication that was being put into uh, serving that crowd of 100. Well, in Memphis, what was that like for you? Because that was not necessarily another famous arena that was studio wrestling that was the last remaining studio wrestling show what was it like for you to get into the studios of wmc channel five well that that was fascinating because we did you know the whole kind of memphis loop so we the friday night we went to a spot show in uh in forest city arkansas was the town uh did memphis tv the next morning went to nashville in the evening and then also did the tuesday night at the louisville gardens and it was kind of particularly interesting obviously we saw the same title uh take place twice same title change um and a lot of the same matches it was kind of quite interesting to see the differences in the the crowds and reactions nashville was you know absolutely straight down the middle they wanted the heels dead um 100 believed everything was on the level louisville seemed to be um you know a bit of a not to say a smarter crowd but kind of more awareness of you know they knew who the masked guys were uh they they knew that if somebody did a lose leave town match they were probably coming back uh, under a new gimmick were next week um they were a lot you know a lot more into boarding around the arena that kind of thing so fast forwarding all these years later you've been writing about wrestling for years you have first-hand knowledge and experience of being around and interacting with people and that's kind of what led to the book you're writing about wrestling and you started interacting with a lot of the legends of world of sport a lot of the legends of british wrestling and this book the genesis of it is from an article you were writing in fighting spirit magazine correct that's right. Yeah, it's uh, Brian Elliott, the editor, had just taken over, and he was looking very much at the idea of doing kind of a different take on Angle, something a bit different to you know the traditional. This is what happened at the WWE pay per view month. You know, this is what John Cena has done in the last three years. So he came up with the idea of doing a piece on Pat Roach, who is a, a wrestler, but also as a television and film star actor who's worked in the James Bond films, the Indiana Jones films, and try and get sort of a, a picture of his kind of life in that world and how it transferred over. Um, I was lucky enough to track down Vic Armstrong, who is the kind of the stuntman, stuntman of stuntmen, um, and worked on those films, would be the body double for the James Bond, or for sort of Harrison Ford so did a lot of the stunts with uh, Pat Roach and they'd worked together and he told, was telling me about how they would get together and kind of take Pat Roach's ideas for these are moves that look very visual that kind of suit a big man throwing a little man about uh, and then Vic Armstrong would go well, here's where we can do it and we have to do it slightly differently here because with the cameras and multiple takes we're going to have to take the same bump 20 times in a row so we can't do it exactly as you do it in a wrestling ring because you're getting up crippled so we have to kind of do it at a slightly different angle and they came to kind of work together and the response to that was much better than we expected we kind of thought a lot of people would not be interested in it because it's it's not a wwe it's not the current scene and we got sort of a good response and that's where we got the idea for doing this uh, monthly series called greetings grapple fans going into this series how familiar were you with all the ins and outs of British wrestling history? Had you been studying British wrestling history for years already? What did you know? What didn't you know? Well, I had watched it uh, as a little bit uh, as as a fan, as a kind of a 
small child about uh, 10 to 12 years old in the few years before it went off but I wouldn't really call myself kind of a wrestling fan there it was more it was another TV show that I'd watch if I was around and it was on um, really got into the, uh, the American wrestling and then sort of into ECW into Japan and so on um, had seen a few old tapes mainly of guys like William Regal Bret Hart when they were in the, the UK and where I really got into it was the wrestling channel started up on satellite television over here in 2004. And it was a 24 hour wrestling channel, kind of, you know, exactly what you, you'd imagine with kind of tapes from all around the world. And they struck a deal with ITV to get the old world of sport, that kind of era wrestling tapes to, to re-show. And they asked me to go through their archive, which was in a terrible state. It was uh, just these lists of matches, uh, just, you know, just surnames, no running order, no times or anything, and put together the episodes. Um, so we'd start off sort of theming them on kind of wrestlers that people would be familiar with, again, like the Hart family, like Al Hayes, uh, people like Dynamite Kid, and would do an episode on them. And then kind of for people who are their opponents in that, we might then do an episode on them when people are more familiar with it. And stemming from that, I uh, kind of got involved in a, a research project, uh, which is still going at itvwrestling.co.uk, where we went back through the old British equivalent of TV Guide, which had the listings every week for the matches and kind of turned that into an archive then got together with historians of, of that era who used to keep records of women matches. We then had the results. And then sort of the last big upgrade is in the last couple of years is we've embedded all the videos on YouTube that we can find. So it's kind of the semi-quasi-legal uh, ITV wrestling version of the WWE Network. So people became familiar with a lot of the legends of British wrestling because of these videos that went around. Obviously, there are videos on YouTube. And you start doing these articles for Fighting Spirit Although we are in now an age where a lot of the guys, if not all of the guys, pretty much understand kayfabe is dead, people want to know the real stories, there were still guys of a certain era, at least in America, and I'm going to ask you about in England, who may not feel comfortable breaking kayfabe today. So what was it like for you? It's one thing to want to do the articles. What was it like for you to approach a lot of these old wrestlers and get them to open up and tell you the truth? And second question as part of that is how fast into the interview with Adrian Street did he tell you how much he hated Big Daddy? <laughs> that was um, probably very quickly into it. Yeah, that was <laughs> was not a fan. It really, it kind of had a bit of a snowball effect because we, we did a couple which were on the obvious first names, you know, your Big Daddy, your Jackie Palo, where we were kind of relying a lot heavily on kind of secondary sources. So kind of it was more this is what they did, these are the matches they had, this is what so-and-so said about them in a book. Um, but luckily, uh, Brian Elliott, the editor, I believe it's a sort of a second cousin or some sort of relation like that to Eddie Hamill, who was Kung Fu. So he was able to set up doing a, an interview with him. And once we'd done that, he could then sort of vouch to us to another wrestler and say, you know, this guy's kind of on the level who is respectful, is, you know, not going to try and, you know, expose anything, but he's going to sort of ask you about the business. And the more of those you got, the more they would, you know, act as a sort of a vouching for you or they'd suggest people you could write about. And it eventually got to the, the idea where sort of, you know, wrestlers were actually getting in touch and saying, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to take part in this and, and sort of talk about it. I would probably say about 5% of the people we interviewed, we did, there's 55 profiles in the book and then another uh, 10 articles that are about uh, particular aspects like particular venues, like the FA Cup final days for promoters and so on. But probably only about 5% were, you know, absolutely hardcore. Even when you pressed on it, they were completely telling you everything was on the level, which was quite interesting to write up because you then had to kind of write it in a way that, the people reading it could still get the grips as to what you were saying about kind of a behind the scenes thing, but the guy reading it didn't get, you know, didn't think you you sort of made him look silly. A lot of the other kind of wrestlers you talked to, it was more opening up the questioning, being sort of very respectful and making sure that you, uh, you know, they didn't think you were trying to unveil all these big secrets and sort of call them a phony. So one thing that I would always do is quite early on, I, I'd ask the question, when did you first to start feeling comfortable in the ring? And that wasn't necessarily to get, you know, to get the answer and use that in print. It was more to see how they'd respond to that. 
um, if they sort of responded, you know, oh, I had this match with with Mick McManus, and he was he was great. He you know took care of me of being the ring. Uh, really wanted to knew that if he made me look good, it looked good for him when he won the match, which is what uh, a couple of people said. You knew then you being able to have a good interview. If their response was, oh, it was, you know, three months in, I, I learned this secret move and I could win all my matches in inside two hours. <laughs> it was brilliant. Yeah. You knew you were going to have to, you know, maybe take a different aspect, uh, talk about some of their sort of, you know, outside brewing life, sort of the other elements of their career. When you got going with this project, what did you have? Did you have like a hit list of like the top 10 guys you wanted to get and then you filled in in between there? Who was the hardest guy for you to get? Um, I mean, there were a couple, I would say the ones we didn't get. One was Wayne Bridges, who is, uh, he was sort of the British version of the world champion for a bit in the 1980s. And it's actually his uh, pub is where the annual reunion is held. And that was just, he was very interested to do it. But every time I'd phone him, he'd, you know, have something else, uh, something else on. So I never really knew if that was sort of, you know, if he kind of changed his mind on that or it was just, you know, busy lifestyle. The, the other one, obviously, was Kendo Nagasaki, whose whole gimmick is that he's a masked man who never speaks, which makes it very difficult to uh, do a phone interview. Um, I'm guessing and, he's one of the five that did not want to break. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, you couldn't really interview him at all. Um, and there was you know, the chance of doing email questions, but you knew it was going to be one of his sort of, you know, his, his spiritual advisors would be answering. So it's kind of, I think that was one where it's much more interesting to take it in the same way we did when we were doing wrestlers who've now passed away which was talking to people in Uva and worked with him in the wrestling business and had sort of great stories about them. Obviously, World of Sport has been in the news lately because a variation of it is back on TV in England. But when we go back to this original period of time, this original glory period for British wrestling on TV, explain to the listeners in America who may not know too much about it just how big it was. What kind of ratings did it get? How much of the country watched it? How much the country knew of wrestling? And who were the biggest stars? So to put it into context, it was, if you could imagine the sort of the Dumont uh, era of uh, the network television of wrestling in America, if that had lasted for, you know, 20 years before it even started to go down. For most of the time that the ITV wrestling was on and Wells of Sports was uh, the magazine program on Saturday afternoons that had a lot of different sports and then wrestling was always kind of the main attraction. It was always four o'clock in the afternoon uh, before the football results. And then in its sort of peak periods, they'd also have a midweek late evening show as well. And it was in time where for most of this time, there were only three channels you could get in the whole of the UK. So anything that was on one of these channels would do very well. And there's all sorts of nonsense claims about, you know, how much should be ratings did. But I mean, verified at its peak, it would be doing seven to eight million people. And that's at a time when the UK population was well under 60, something more like 50 million people. So you're talking at times up to 15 to 20 percent of the population was watching this every week. It comes up a lot here, and I'm sure you're quite aware of it. The debate over Big Daddy which all stems from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame. He's not in. He has not received the support. Obviously, Dave Meltzer is one vote, but it is his Hall of Fame. He's been vocal about his feelings about why Big Daddy is not a Hall of Famer. We've had Alan Blackstock on the show defending vociferously Big Daddy being hands down a Hall of Famer. What do you think of this debate? Being someone who has looked into British wrestling history, but also someone who spoke to so many of Big Daddy's contemporaries. What do you think of this debate about his star magnitude and if he's a Hall of Famer or not? Well, how you approach it is, uh, I, I would say, is if you want to argue Big Daddy is a Hall of Famer and that's why the criteria for Wrestling Observer Hall is wrong, then that's, you know, you're welcome to kind of make that argument. I kind of can respect and see the argument you're making there. If your argument is by the criteria and rules of Wrestling Observer, Big Daddy is in, then absolutely no, because it's you have to have something to offer in all three ta- categories of ring work, sort of you know, star power, historical importance, and drawing, or be so outstanding among the best of, of your sort of your generation in one stand down. Ring work is a nothing. I mean, it's not necessarily bad work. It's almost non-existent work because he was uh, in tag teams all the time, would come in for you know a couple of minutes at the finish very deliberately because the time that he was on top, it was built very much about he is the star, everything is built around him and they don't want to take risk of him being injured because if he's out, that's going to hurt. 
you know, drawing power is certainly very strong. He could easily double an audience or sell out a, a building but didn't regularly sell out. The asterisk on that is uh, you couldn't bring people who sort of booked him, said, you know, the next week when he wasn't on, your crowd would be straight back down to normal. He wouldn't sort of make any extra fans. And also, if you brought him back too quickly, he wouldn't have the same effect. He was kind of a, a he generally would wrestle only once or twice a year in a venue. And then historical importance, certainly by far the biggest name uh, for his generation in, in wrestling. People of a certain age would would say Mick McManus or Jackie Palo. Since then, it's the Epic Daddy is by far the biggest sort of mainstream cult star. The the asterisk again there is is it's deliberately set as historical importance and an influence with a positive effect. The problem with with Big Daddy is it was very much a change of business from what was previously a business built around the quantity of shows every night, kind of like Mexico City at times. But in the UK, you had joint promotions who are the version of the NWA here were running 15 shows a night. You'd often have 10 to 15 independent shows a night, which worked great when you had 30 guys who could be main eventers around the country off the back of television. When it's kind of built all around him, it meant that a lot of the other shows, uh, you couldn't run as many shows. The other ones didn't seem kind of as prestigious to the, uh, the more casual audience. And a lot of the, uh, the biggest regular venues actually stopped running during his time on top. So it's certainly that kind of counterbalance to, to his undoubted uh, you know, level. If you take Hall of Fame literally, then yes, he, he, he goes in because he's famous. A couple of questions coming out of that. One, you spoke earlier about the fact that you had some passing knowledge of wrestling, but it was really the WWF that got you pulled in. And then that developed throughout the 90s with the things that a lot of us smart fans got into. But growing up as a kid, not being someone who religiously watched it, how big was Big Daddy in the culture? How aware were you and your friends of Big Daddy? I mean, if pretty much everybody would would know the name. Um, I mean, to give an example, um, a couple of years ago, there's a television show here called Pointless, where the idea is to you get asked a question and you have to, if you get it, the answer correct, it's then compared to a hundred people have asked it. It's kind of family feud in reverse. So you're trying to look for a question that you know the answer to, and the general public don't. Uh, and they did a photo round where they'd shown five photos of wrestlers to the general public. Um, it, I think it was Hulk Hogan, The Rock, Andre the Giant, Kendo Nagasaki, and Big Daddy. And Big Daddy was the highest with with 70 percent. So that's, you know, 70 percent of uh, the people they asked in, in the general public recognized a photograph of him. The recognition is there. And obviously, a lot of fans would immediately say a Hall of Fame is ridiculous if Big Daddy's not in it. But I asked you about his contemporaries. What did the other wrestlers say? I joke at the beginning about Adrian Street, about him immediately saying something because he always does. He always points out that in his eyes, Big Daddy was the death of British wrestling. The other wrestlers you spoke to, so many of them worked with him. What did they think? What was the consensus, if there was one? Very much not a consensus, absolutely. Uh, you know, a mixed response. Uh, the the guys, guys who worked with him and didn't enjoy the experience because they felt they were doing all the work and he was getting all the glory. There were also, you know, guys who worked opposite him who absolutely loved it. You know, they, they made money with him, not as much money as they'd have liked, which is, you know, the story of wrestling all over the world. Yeah. Um, you know, there were there were people who who kind of saw him as building the business up. So they maybe, you know, wouldn't have got as much work if he wasn't around. On the other hand, you know, there's people who kind of saw he was getting a lot of the attention and it was meant, you know, business was going down elsewhere. So there weren't as, as much work and as many dates for other people. One of his most famous opponents was Giant Haystacks, or in America as he was known, Loch Ness, a rather uh, unfortunate gimmick in WCW. But to those who never saw him and him and Big Daddy, just how big was that feud? And talk a little bit about him, because he was also someone who had a lot of crossover appeal. I know if you watch maybe the young ones, you'll hear a reference to Giant Haystacks. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, the 
anytime you hear the sentence Big Daddy, it, it often ends in, in giant haystacks. Uh, they had uh, one of certainly the biggest TV feuds. Uh, though it, it's often said they sold out Wembley Arena, which was one of sort of the big indoor arenas here. Actually, they did it about 60% capacity, and you can actually watch the television. And they're sort of going past banks and banks of empty seating. So the, the biggest feud really was Big Daddy and John Quinn, who was a Canadian wrestler who forgot his heritage on the way over here and suddenly became American. And to put into context kind of how um, sort of non-Americanized, non-gimmicks a lot of West wrestling was here, he got amazing heat just by the fact that he spoke on the microphone and said that his daddy had always told him that, you know, the British, the Limeys were cowards during the war and had to be saved by the Americans. And this was, you know, <laughs> absolutely heat. Um, because the, the television format, which was different to uh, particularly a lot of the American wrestling at the time, is that it's it's not like WWF who produce their programs and their tapes and give it to the TV channels. It was actually ITV Sport went and filmed it as if they were filming any other sports, if they were going to a boxing show or horse racing event, so their crew would turn up. And there was this kind of unspoken uh, understanding that... Uh, at the very least, it, it had to be credible in some way. Um, one wrestler used a great word. He said, you know, the matches had to be plausible. So about elements of suspension of disbelief, which is why you had Kent Walton as a commentator was very straight laced, understated, kind of calling it in a lot of times as if it was a real sport. Similar kind of uh, kind of thing to uh, Gordon Soley in Florida. And that kind of meant that when you did have these, these sort of odd things of people grabbing the microphone it really stood over and Jackie Palo in the 60s his big thing was he wore striped trunks in the 1960s and had pigtails in his hair um, and that was enough to you know be absolutely outrageous and kind of attract attention um, and we, we talked about Adrian Street he then did uh, a very kind of glam rock character and then like, later came over kind of more androgynous and feminine and really was the guy who, who took a lot of uh, the, the benefit of the switch from black and white to color television. He sort of really stood out then. What about Cat Weasel? He was great. That was an interesting one to cover because I, I'd sort of talked to all his family. He's, he's died now. And actually it was his funeral uh, that a lot of the wrestlers met up and realized the only time we, we sort of see each other now is when we get together at funerals. So we should get together in happier circumstances. And that led to the annual reunion, sort of the British version of the Cauliflower Alley Club. But I was kind of writing this piece up and I, I did a bit about his kind of in-ring career and suddenly realised there's, there's very little to put here because he never held any titles. He rarely, if ever, was a main event. He didn't have any sort of massive feuds. But he was this this comedy character and that was kind of a part of the, the package. Um, it's described by sort of some promoters as when you have a meal and you have sort of different courses and then you have your dessert at the end. Um, and his job was to send the crowd, crowd home happy so they do this kind of comedy match at the end uh which was a couple of reasons for doing that one was that the the main event would often be extremely heated uh kind of riling the crowd up to try and get them to come back to the next week and you didn't necessarily want them going straight out of the building you know getting onto public transport still in that kind of mood and and letting the, the name of wrestling down but also the other big benefit was that uh, a lot of the shows mysteriously ended at exactly the right time for people to get the last bus home. A lot of people would get <laughs> public transport. So depending on how the rest of the show had gone, you might have a you know, very varied amount of time left for this last match. And if it was quite short, you didn't necessarily want the main event in that slot because you didn't want that to be curtailed. Whereas the, the comedy stuff, it was a lot easier to uh, sort of, you know, expand or contract that match as needed just by picking out particular spots. And if it was longer, um, a lot of kind of the villains in the heels in, in that match, um, they would like to wrestle straight for a couple of rounds. Uh, with the idea being that when they then started cheating, the crowd would get much more upset. It wasn't like the US kind of the, the argument, the, the Chris Adams explaining to Steve Austin, you know, these are the stages of the match and what you're doing, where a lot of the idea there is the, the good guy starts off 
showing he's the better wrestler and the bad guy has to resort to cheating because he's not as good. A lot of the times you get heat in Britain by showing you could wrestle straight. You could be, you know, a fair, legitimate, good wrestler, but you chose to cheat because you were just, you know, such a scoundrel, such a kind of a, a, a cheating person who, who would cheat even when they didn't need to. And that would be the thing that would most annoy Kent Walton on the commentary is when he saw someone who was a, a good technical wrestler who didn't use those skills. In terms of like a cat weasel, for example, obviously comedy wrestling today is nothing like comedy wrestling was back then. Comedy spots are nothing like they were back then. But when you talk to wrestlers from that generation, were there guys who really didn't like what was comedy wrestling for that generation? Yeah, I mean, you'd, ha- you'd have some, um, but there, uh, there was sort of such a diversity in the wrestlers that you if you didn't like the kind of comedy stuff, but you could do a different kind of match and you'd kind of never have to wrestle them. So they'd know there were certain heels who were either very sort of straight wrestlers or they were kind of heels who were being built up to kind of dominate sort of all their opponents. They would never be put into a comedy match um, because it would kind of undermine their gimmick. So you kind of think you have this, this format where a lot of the time you'd open up with kind of just a straight basic heavyweight, good guy, bad guy match. You then have a, uh, a sort of a, a baby face baby face match which was often the lightweights uh, being sort of a technical wrestling showing what you know wrestling is meant to be when you do the uh follow the rules which would be followed by the main event where you would have you know the top villain would be doing all the cheating and now you'd established these are the rules this is what a proper wrestler does you'd get more wound up when you then saw somebody breaking the rules and um, then you'd have the, the happy match at the end to kind of bring the crowd down and sort of sign off for the night you said earlier that joint promotions, the Crabtrees, was the NWA for England. You write about Brian Dixon in your book. If they're the NWA, what's Brian Dixon? Well, he would be, if you can imagine, uh, an, an outlaw promotion that you know succeeded and took over in the, in the later years. And it's kind of amazing to think now because in the cycle of wrestling, he in later years would be kind of seen as the the old school kind of guy, the one who was just appealing to families, you know, very basic, not as great high spot wrestling as other ones were doing. But back in in his day when he sort of started his promotion, he based around a couple of things. One would be he would use women wrestlers, including his his partner and later wife Mitzi Mueller, um, and there were no women wrestlers on joint promotions because it was kind of seen as as unseemly and kind of not uh, part of like traditional wrestling. So that was a big attraction, but also he'd have more action in his matches, um, have kind of more technical wrestlers. Mark Rocco would come over to him, was one of the big names he pulled over, and they'd be going more for sort of a more hardcore kind of wrestling heavy audience. How big was the feud between the two promotions, between the two promoters? Well, what tended to happen with joint promotions is they were kind of in some ways almost more effective and ruthless than the the NWA in terms of their control. And generally, if you stuck to towns that they didn't run, but were either sort of too small or just uh, was kind of too far afield from where they were based. And joint promotions, to say, was like the NWA, so you had promoters in different areas of the country, but there's still some, some places that were too far for it to be kind of economical for their kind of wrestlers to get to. If you stuck to those areas, you tended not to have any problems. If you promoted in towns that they ran regularly, um, even if it was kind of a different venue, then you did run into problems and you'd have, you know, the same as, as any other problems. You'd find your posters might suddenly disappear or, you know, venues wouldn't want to deal with you. Yeah, you said they were ruthless. How ruthless were they? Well, it was it was um, a lot of the times it was difficult to prove, but, pe- you know, people knew what would happen and kind of their their biggest period of strength is when they could offer wrestlers kind of full-time work they'd get their date sheet each month which told you you know which towns you're going to where you were booked and you were happy because you're working full-time um when they have that kind of level of strength they could enforce the fact that if you worked for them you could not work for the opposition um you'd have guys would maybe do a match under a mask or something uh to kind of get away with it but if it was heard that you were working for the opposition that was it you would you know your date sheet would suddenly run very dry in the later years as they kind of switched the model and started running fewer shows it got to the point where they couldn't really enforce that because if you only worked for them you weren't making enough to kind of make a full-time living you used to have to go and get a, a, a sort of a real job 
or just go and start working for the opposition. When they were at their peak and they were running 15 shows a night, what was the average salary for, what was the average pay for a main eventer? What was the average pay for a preliminary guy? Could a guy make a good living? Yeah, I mean, you could make, um, if you were a, sort of a main eventer and particularly a top star, you, you could make it into kind of a full-time job. Uh, and then kind of people lower on the card, uh, you tend to work your local area. So you could work a day job, go home. They'd call it a tea time job because you could go home, have your evening meal, and then get to the venue in the next night. And because there were so many venues, you'd often have you know, seven towns running Monday to Sunday round you all within sort of a half hour's drive because there was no need uh, for fans to, to kind of travel. They'd always go to their, their local venue and it's only a very small kind of hardcore audience who would, would make the effort to sort of go to, to somewhere else because they literally want to see wrestling as much as they could. Um, the the pay structure was kind of quite different to the US model where you're kind of on a percentage of a gate. If you, you worked for joint promotions, you you got a flat payoff for each match, which you would negotiate when you sort of took on your career and when if you could try to get a pay rise if you kind of proved yourself as more valuable. But your pay didn't depend on the gate and the idea was it kind of would even out. There'd be good nights and bad nights. One interesting thing of that is it meant for very, very top stars who like your Jackie Palo, your Mick McManus, they might actually work much smaller van- venues than you might imagine as a, a top guy. And the idea was there, so it was there, they could really make the most difference. So in a, a regular venue that was having wrestling every week, having big stars there all the time having one more extra guy might not make any difference if you went to a smaller town uh, a lot of the time it might be the only place you could see someone not just from wrestling but somebody from television appearing in your town and not only that but unlike other kind of guest appearances you might get a soap uh, actor or so somebody like a celebrity like that would come and you know, open a face or something or do a public appearance, but they wouldn't actually be doing what they were doing on television. They weren't their character from TV. Whereas if you saw a wrestling show, you were actually seeing, you know, the wrestling star doing the wrestling match and performing for you um, in your town. And that was the draw in itself. You write about several British wrestlers who would later gain fame in the United States and throughout the world, including Chris Adams and William Regal. The British Bulldogs have a chapter in your book And I'm always interested in talking to someone from England about them because we've all seen the heights that Davey Boy reached in the early 90s with his popularity in England. At that time, how aware was the public of Dynamite, even though he had been on World of Sport years earlier, when Davey Boy was that major star, when SummerSlam 92 was built around Davey Boy, how aware was the public of Dynamite? Really, by then, a lot of the people weren't kind of aware of him because the 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 big boom over here in the WWF wrestling didn't really come about till about 1989, 1990. Although uh, satellite television, Sky TV, had actually shown WWF since about 1985, most people back then couldn't get it because you either had to have cable TV, which virtually nobody had. Um, or you had to have, you know, the kind of satellite dish that has to sit on its own in your backyard and is, you know, too big to move anywhere. And in 1989, they they moved to a different satellite and they had what they called the mini dish, which is the satellite uh, dish that you can put on the side of your house, right. which made it a, a lot more popular. And WWF was by far the most popular programming on there, uh, sort of neck neck with The Simpsons. Um, so 1991, 92 was kind of a short lived. Uh, real sort of mainstream craze for WWF here. And of course, by then, Dynamite was, you know, long out of the picture and certainly not being mentioned by by WWF. And, you know, he was kind of brought back in his later years to do sort of tours of the UK. Um, and there really wasn't that uh, kind of name recognition. The only thing that really works is that um, people would occasionally just have posts that just said British Bulldog. And of course, when you turned up and Dynamite Kid was there, you couldn't really complain because he was a British Bulldog. But did anyone know that? Well, that that was the thing. I mean, it had to be explained to some people. I mean, sort of people who were old enough to remember sort of 10 years earlier um, watching the, the British stuff would certainly remember the name because he was you know, a legitimately an absolute sensation here with on, on TV and sort of a year or two that he was here, um, despite being very kind of uh, very young guy. 
and really much smaller than when he went to the States and sort of bolt up there, but was amazingly fast paced and kind of changing the, the business with guys like Mark Rocco, Marty Jones, who were sort of doing a much faster pace, more athletic style than was sort of the, the norm at the time. You had all those guys. You had all those really amazing athletic wrestlers. You had so many great Japanese wrestlers come over from Tiger Mask to Jushin Liger and get their breaks early in their careers under different names in England. At the same time, you had much bigger guys and much older guys. And with that said, obviously, you have a chapter on Big Daddy. Obviously, you have a chapter on King Kong Kirk. Can you talk a little bit about what happened? The famous match. And also, when it comes to the end of world of sport on tv was that the primary reason really no the end of the tv i mean partly business itself had certainly dipped down as kind of you know the big daddy thing got a bit old and as i say they were running kind of fewer venues it was taken off television uh, primarily uh, because the new guy who'd taken over in charge of ITV called Greg Dyke um, decided that he wanted to appeal more to advertisers and thought the way to do that was to upscale the TV, go for a more middle class audience who'd have more money to spend. And that was very different idea to World of Sports, which ITV was on and was always for less glamorous, more working class kind of sports. World Sport ended in 1985. The wrestling being the most popular bit was still kept on as a kind of a show of its own, but it moved time slot every week, which a lot of the wrestlers kind of have this conspiracy theory that may well have a lot of truth into it, but that was done to kind of gradually wear away the audience because they wouldn't know when it was going to be on. So you you had to be quite kind of dedicated, particularly, you know, time before uh, people were sort of DVRing things. And that was used as for justification, but it, it was... Primarily, it was about uh, going for a different audience with the idea that wrestling was much more kind of a working class, uh, not having as much money to spend and not as appealing to advertisers. And then Big Daddy and King Kong Kirk. Yeah, so I mean, that was um, King Kong Kirk, who was you know, a very well-respected guy um, among among his peers, uh, had had you know, quite a successful rugby league career before he went in and was you know well known as having great stamina particularly for uh you know a very big kind of uh bald-headed kind of round very round guy um who you know dave taylor said he'd, he'd do this kind of thing to you where he challenged you to arm drag him 15 times and you would think you know how many times can i do this before he's going to blow up and eventually you would blow up giving him the arm drags because <laughs> he was so much fitter than you um but yeah he died after a match with with big daddy which was it, it turned out to be a pre-existing heart condition but of course it was you know reported in papers as big daddy does his his big splash of a finishing move on this this wrestler and then he dies and there was a a lot of kind of uh problems in the press with Ray report that was reported because big daddy was uh, still kind of tried to maintain the idea that this was a, a legitimate sporting contest which uh, a lot of people kind of took as you know not the right place to be doing that and also his his widow was you know understandably quite disappointed with the way that this had happened and also you know talked about his payoffs which were you know really not very much for the kind of work he was doing and the fact that he was helping make keep the bigger star kind of still relevant and, and still active how much publicity did that get at the time? Yeah, I mean, that was a uh, national newspaper and national television coverage uh, was sort of very interesting. I mean, as as is still the case today, I think uh, uh, a lot, anything to do with wrestling, because it was so popular, uh, would be kind of of interesting to the newspapers, even though it would, you know, never usually be in a positive manner. So you had various exposés over the years. Uh, one of them, there was a referee who'd become quite disgruntled with the promoters. So he was set up to go and actually wear the wire in the dressing room uh, while kind of talking over the two contenders for the British heavyweight title at the match were talking over their match beforehand and this was all on tape and of course it turned out exactly like they said and it's actually quite surprising reading the transcript then of exactly how detailed they were um, about what they were going to do the match and how they were going to do the finish considering that a lot of the British wrestling 
because it was kind of based on on kind of real and amateur wrestling a lot more of it was uh, kind of improvised particularly with the per round system so british wrestling was done over a series of five and later three minute rounds and you would have to have uh, two falls or two submissions or a knockout to win so you you if you won a decision that was the end of the round you'd go to the next one otherwise after five minutes you'd have a break which Bret Hart talks about he absolutely hated um, because he would kind of just get something going, be starting to tell a story, and then the bell would ring and you'd have to stop and kind of reset the whole story. Other people actually loved it because it works as a, a really happy medium between completely scripting out a match, you know, move for move, and completely improvising it. So kind of for, for compromise there, particularly when you had, you know, an old school and new school guy doing it, is you could talk about, maybe one thing for each round to you know round one i'm going to work over your arm you know round two you're going to make the comeback get the surprise fall round three you know i'm going to you know take a dirty advantage round four i'm going to carry on on that and you get the equalizer round five it looks like i'm about to win round six you get the last uh last minute sudden decision when it looks like it's going to a draw and with that you've got you know, the basis of a good story, but you can still improvise a bit, feed off the crowd and, and see how that goes. Knowing what we know now, seeing the popularity that the World Wrestling Federation would have in England in the 90s, if the ITV manager had not taken them off the air, do you think there was any future for the program? Um it's hard to say because in 1987, uh, so this was for the last two years it was on air, joint promotions, their contract came to an end. And rather than just renew it and give them a complete monopoly, uh, ITV decided to experiment a bit. So they gave a few shows to all-star promotions who have a big opposition. And they had, uh, I believe it was four times a year, they showed WWF programming, which I know – people of my age uh, sort of remember seeing this and going how can this British wrestling compare you know you're showing that for British wrestling the ITV uh, kind of the regulators the version of the, the FCC I guess over here were very tight on you you couldn't have kind of excessive violence you know weapon use anything like that and Mark Rocco used to absolutely hate that because you know, he'd come up with all these these ideas for matches um, and then they'd all be edited out. But the, the first show over here was the Hulk Hogan-Randy Savage lumberjack match from Madison Square Garden. Yeah. So if you can imagine as, you know, sort of 10, 12-year-old child going to playground the next day after, you know, all these years of seeing, you know, kind of sports-based technical wrestling, in many cases, kind of a slower paced uh, style. And then suddenly you're watching these two giants in front of 20,000 people. And there's 20 wrestlers outside the ring, all fighting with each other. Just, you know, how completely amazing that looks in, in comparison. So a lot of um, people kind of theorize that if they kept it on a few more years, it would probably have got to the point where it was replaced with WWF television because it would have been so much cheaper. You were literally just paying uh, the equivalent of a few hundred dollars to get the tape shipped over. Whereas with the British wrestling, it was ITV themselves were not only going to the cost of going out there, filming the shows, producing them, but giving a, a fairly hefty fee to, to join promotions for the rights to the footage. The book is Have a Good Week. Till next week. British Wrestlers of the TV Era by John Lister. John, thank you for being here. This is our book of the week. I'm going to let you do the sign-off considering your book title. Well, thank you very much. And in the words of uh, Ken Walton, have a good week. Till next week. There he is, John Lister, author of the brand new book, Have a Good Week. Till next week, British Wrestlers of the TV Era, our book of the week. And of course, what that means is you can get this book at tinyurl.com slash superpod Amazon. That is our show Amazon referral link. By using that link, you don't spend any more money than you would normally spend at Amazon, but by making a purchase after using that link, you help this show out. This show does not pound you with ads. This show does not have sponsors for every single segment. We try to do things in a very respectful manner with integrity here on this show. And if you appreciate that and want to continue to support it, then please use tinyurl.com slash superpod Amazon for all of your Amazon purchases. Lots of other shows have links they want you to use. Lots of other shows suck. So you have to ask yourself, which show am I going to support? Is it going to be the one that sucks or is it going to be the mothership? I think if you ask yourself that question, the answer will be quite apparent. When it comes down to it, when it comes down to them or us, 
Fuck those guys. Support the Super Podcast. Support your Super Podcast. Well, with that, let's go to our main event, Howard. I had an opportunity to speak with Broadway Danny Wolf. That is a name that some fans may remember from a while back. And what interesting stories he has here. We're going to hear all about FNN score. We're going to hear about Roller Jam and ECW's involvement with Roller Jam and so much more. This was a fun conversation. Check it out right now. Here's Broadway Danny Wolf. We are back on the Super Podcast with a man I have been very much looking forward to speaking with, a man who has been mentioned to me many times by Dan Farron, by Kurt Brown, and he is here today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Super Podcast, Broadway Danny Wolf. Thank you, Brian. Very nice to finally be on the show. I'm doing great, thanks. Well, it's very nice to finally have you here. You know, you're one of these guys, your name is connected with so many interesting things, so many interesting areas of wrestling and roller derby, which, of course, so many wrestling fans are roller derby fans. Let's go back to the beginning, the very beginning. What was the first wrestling you saw, and what are your first memories of wrestling? Well, of course, growing up in Los Angeles, we had the Olympic Auditorium, so, you know, Women had Dynasty in Dallas and General Hospital and All My Children, and guys like me had professional wrestling and roller derby. So, (laughs) you know, I think my Saturdays when it wasn't Little League season was waking up in the morning and watching WWF Superstars or Challenge and then waiting for the middle of the day. We got out here a little earlier, you know, the old Gordon Sully, Tony Schiavone, the uh, NWA. Yeah. And then at night, world class, sometimes AWA would pop up and, you know, it was one of those. And then watching the T-Birds, of course, in the morning as well. You know, my Saturdays consisted of, you know, a couple hours of roller derby and four or five, six hours of wrestling. And, and then Wally George, of course, hot seat at midnight, <laughs> which uh, we, we, we can't forget about those those days. So, you know, it was just really watching wrestling. And it's funny, I would even watch the, the wrestling from the Olympic Auditorium would be on the UHF st- uh, station as well in Spanish. So I would even watch on weeknights that be the Spanish telecast and not understand a word they're saying, but you still were able to watch the same matches. And, you know, of course, I mean, look who we had out here between, you know, a young Roddy Piper and Andre the Giant would come out for the Battle Royals and, you know, Haystack Calhoun and Gorman and Goliath and the Twin Devils and Victor Rivera. And we had so many good wrestlers that came in and out of here. It was, you know, it was a great, you appreciate it a lot more now then when you were watching it as a kid and you just go, wow, if LaBelle wouldn't have destroyed all those tapes, how many people would have loved to have watched that even today? I know. That's one of the most frustrating things is that everything's gone. Everything. Yeah. And they would, they would tape over it too. When did you first start watching LA wrestling and when did you first start going to the Olympic? I started watching wrestling probably, I would, I would say in around 74, 75, my parents wouldn't let me go on Friday nights to the Olympic because it was in a bad part of town. And I couldn't go to roller derby, to T-Bird games on Saturday nights for the same reason. So the first time I went to either was the LA T-Birds went to the Forum for a big triple header on a Sunday, which was the Forum was where the Lakers and the Kings played. And that was okay to go to. So my first ever roller derby would have been at the Forum. And my first time going to wrestling wouldn't have been the Olympic. It might have been another venue it could have been the sports arena or long beach and then i finally you know when i was able to drive of course then i was going to the olympic and for wrestling and roller derby was there a big overlap in the crowd that was going to wrestling and the crowd that was going to see the t-birds at the olympic yeah yeah i mean you know it's like you said earlier it's it's you know they're sister sports so the fans of wrestling are usually the fans of roller derby and, and vice versa Except for when it comes to Roller Jam and the ECW fans, kind of <laughs> far apart. Well, we'll, we'll get, get to there. that later. Yeah, but we'll yeah, the, but yeah, no, it was generally the same fans. I mean, you know, it was the Olympic Auditorium was like a clubhouse. So I mean, they did, you know, it was boxing Thursday and wrestling Friday and roller derby Saturday. And I think you know you'd see a lot, at least on television, you saw a lot of the same faces in the crowd, including the Chicken Lady and all those same fans. So yeah, it was kind lady. of like a clubhouse for people. <laughs> In LA, the chicken lady was the uh, woman who had waved the rubber chicken. That's right. In the front row. That's right. Mike Leno once said this story, and I can't imagine it's true, but it's so outlandish that it's even far fetched for Leno, but it can't be true. <laughs> he said that when Dino Bravo came out to work in Los Angeles, the chicken lady was the one driving him around, and she gave him chlamydia. And I said, come on. I mean, oh. 
Dino Bravo was a young, uh, fairly yeah. attractive man at that time. I would think that <laughs> he would be able to find someone other than the chicken lady who was at least in her 50s. Yeah, I, I don't know. That might be a Dr. Mike story. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, God, it just all these faces. I mean, oh, coming back into my mind, I remember Ox Baker and the Executioner. And now I'm thinking of there was Butcher Paul Brannigan and the Hollywood Blondes and Sir Oliver Humperdinck. And we really had a lot of great people out here. What do you remember about when Piper first got there? Piper, man, he was like a kid. And, you know, he had, I mean, obviously his feud with Chavo Guerrero and Victor Rivera. I mean, he feuded with everybody, but no, he was great. He was new. You hadn't seen someone like him, especially how he worked the mic. Um, you know, it was always great, of course. And he was just this young sort of heel and just got a pop. You know, he just, he was just a, a he was always the best bad guy. I never liked him as, you know, a face because it was like ruining, you know, wasn't utilizing his talent. And uh, then, of course, he was always someone you love to hate, like uh, uh, Steve Austin. But yeah. I just remember a young, charismatic kid that was, you know, didn't seem to have a lot of ring experience, but was just, you know, him and his interviews with Jeff Walton were always just brilliant. And uh, I actually did a pilot with him for a clip show about a year before he passed uh, out here. And Look he was the him. nicest guy in the world. Yeah. And I remember him. He says, you got to watch this video of me. You want to see me almost die? And he I give him my laptop and he goes in the computer and he had smashed a bottle on his head somewhere. It was Portland or Canada. Yeah, I think it was Vancouver. And, maybe. I remember, and he and there's this video. It's probably on YouTube where he found it and he smashes it and just starts bleeding. And the blood's coming out more and more. And he goes, Danny, I literally almost died that night. But he had this glee and just loved showing it. <laughs> and uh, no, Piper was the best. He was the best. So you were already watching when they lost their English television. You actually got to see the studio show from... No, it was, uh, I never went to the studio show. Actually, I did work in... It was at the uh, KCOP, Channel 13, uh, which became our newsroom where I produced sports. And no, I uh, I would have loved to have gone down there and, and seen some of those shows. No, I never went, even though it was 15 minutes from where I lived. And I remember Jeff Walton, they used to have the Beat the Champ, and he had a wheel. And they would spin, it looked like a telephone dial, and they would spin the name of wrestlers, and that was who would wrestle the champ, the beat the champ, and they had the wheel. And that was such a great gimmick, I always thought, which I don't remember anyone else ever doing. And Jeff Walton, of course, was a great writer. He put out the programs, a great promoter, a great interviewer. You know, I love Jeff. Did you ever get into any debates with San Francisco fans over who had the better roller derby or who had the better wrestling? Not until way later, because I wasn't familiar with the Bay Bombers. Even though I'm actually, st I still announce the Bay Bombers to this day. I still go up north when they're games. So, you know, derby and, and roller games were two really different sports. Right. Even though they seem the same. Derby rules, like which you'd see back east with the Philadelphia Warriors or, you know, the teams back there with little Richard Brown or Judy Arnold were. And then the Bay Bombers here with, you know, Joni Weston and Charlie O'Connell was, was defensive, harder to score points, but they would send four jammers out. There would be everyone wearing different kinds of helmets. There'd be pivot blockers. I, I never knew that game because we didn't have it on here. I just knew, you know, the LA T-Birds were sort of America's team and wherever they went around the United States, they were always, you know, the white shirt team. And, you know, it was one jammer against one and games would be 132 to 130 and the T-Birds would always come back in the last jam, no matter how many points they were down to win. And then derby games, you know, the scores were 28-24, 35 30. They were much lower scoring. So when I started announcing, I was actually announcing the comeback of the T-Birds out here and got to announce roller derby at the Olympic Auditorium sort of after the heyday of the T-Birds when it came back and then was also announcing the Bay Bombers up north at the same time. So I was announcing these two completely different styles of game. And I never really liked the derby rules. Uh, I just liked the higher scoring. The T-Birds were more theatrical. Yeah, It was more soap opera. It was more character driven. The games were really high scoring and, you know, you'd see 12 and 15 point jams, you know, by Ralphie Valadares or Ronnie Rain. And I just found the Derby game to be, you know, it's more methodical. It's slower. It was, you were supposed to earn your points. So blocking was the emphasis of a Derby game as opposed to games where you just fly around and score points. Did the wrestlers in LA get the no? The guy, like, did Ralphie Valadares hang out with Roddy Piper ever? I mean, did they know each other? Not, not that I ever knew. It was much different. I mean, the wrestling would be on Friday night, and then they would go do their smaller shows around California, you know, on other days of the week. They'd go to 
you know, San Bernardino or Modesto or Bakersfield or Stockton that go to, you know, up and down the coast. Roller Derby was very much the same when the T-Birds weren't skating Saturday nights. That was the TV taping uh, and sort of the main game of the week. They were also skating other nights a, a week, you know, in San Bernardino, Bakersfield, Modesto, Stockton. So, you know, they were sort of moving around a lot, but I never knew that the, they really hung out together. Not that I ever heard of or knew. We know that LaBelle erased everything. What about the T-Bird Masters? I know some of that stuff used to air on ESPN Classic. I used to love watching it from the late 70s, but where are all the old films of that? You know, that's a good question, too. Yeah, ESPN was running some of the games, and then they went to the showboat. Kind of after, after the heyday was gone, and ESPN was airing the games in Vegas from the showboat. And there's some videotapes that came out with some compilations you'd see of some you know, some games and interviews. But to be honest, I, I guess the Griffiths family owns the tapes. They were the owners of the T-Birds. And Bill Griffiths, who was sort of our Vince McMahon for roller derby out here, passed away a few years ago. And his son, I believe, still has the rights to the T-Birds. But that's a good question. I don't know where all those – I mean, that's a good question. I'd like to find out because – you know, I mean, on YouTube, you actually, there's a, if you put LA T-Birds 1970s, there's a lot of games on YouTube you can watch. I think I may have to do that later on today yep. <laughs> after this interview. But let's, uh, let's get back to wrestling because you mentioned yep. that you watch Superstars and Challenge and all the other shows that were syndicated into the Los Angeles area in the 1980s. When did you actually first start getting involved with professional wrestling? I, when I, gra- I went to USC, uh, even though I was a journalism, journalism major, all I wanted to do was announce wrestling and roller derby for my life. In fact, my ninth grade yearbooks, you know, when you sign friends yearbooks, yeah. a friend of mine showed me one not long ago and every auto, you know, you sign your name at the bottom and I wrote future roller derby announcer <laughs> in every yearbook as a ninth grader. So I knew that's what I, and I always wrote all over my books, names of skaters and logos. So as far as wrestling, I went after USC, I went to a little cable sports network. Actually, wasn't that little at the time called FNN Score, which became FNN Sports. And it was sort of a junior ESPN. And the network had trivia shows and score, you know, weekend updates. You know, on the weekends, we'd show highlights and scores and had a ticker. And it was mostly soccer, kickboxing, some boxing. Kind of, it was a fringe sports network mostly on the weekends. And then during the weekdays, it was financial news, coin reports, and all sorts of that business sort of type programming. So when I got there, basically, I wanted to be, you know, a sports producer and do packages. And the president of the network was a cool dude named Arnie Tokyo Rosenthal. And he was my boss. And he was a huge wrestling fan. He grew up back east. He was a huge fan of Buddy Rogers, Lou Fez wrestlers like that and when i got to the network he had california championship wrestling on and it was pretty bad and the worst i thought mm, that's <laughs> the worst <laughs> yeah not pretty bad the worst i remember the the announcer i actually met years later barry richards was the promoter <laughs> and he didn't know the name of any holds he just make up names for holds so they had this wrestling and i thought, figured you know what I should ask Arnie, there's so many good regional promotions in America that don't get national exposure, and we've got this network. Why don't we put something else on, and maybe that's a way I can get into maybe working in wrestling or getting to at least announce. So he said, hey, if you can do a barter deal with any regional promotion where it's not costing us any money and they deliver us an hour show every week, we've got a deal, and I'll fly you to whatever promotion it is, and you can announce like the FNN score match of the week. And I'm like, done. (laughs) <laughs> Perfect. And just started calling like Don Owens in Portland and I'm calling Florida and I'm just calling. And finally, somewhere I got Jerry Jarrett's phone number said, you got this great show. It's a studio show on the weekends and you do, you know, your, your territory, but would you like national exposure? You guys are great. I mean, Lawler and Dundee and Gilbert and all these great guys. And he's like, sure. What he thought it was like, it's too good to be true. What's the hook? I said, the hook is you fly me Mondays to Memphis. And I announced at the Mid-South Coliseum with Lance Russell, like one match, our <laughs> FNN score, the ma- score match of the week. I'll put a banner up ringside on the ring, on the apron, and then fly me back the next morning. And he's like, okay. And next thing I knew, you know, my boss, Arnie, and I are in the airport in Memphis, and Lawler's there to meet us for our first, you know, show. And I remember walking in the airport, and Arnie goes, you need a nickname. If you're going to announce, you need a nickname. And I said, what? And he goes, well, you know, Broadway Danny Rose was a pretty good Woody Allen movie. You'll be Broadway Danny. I'm like, okay. 
<laughs> and the that. first interview I did just like that. And I remember the first show or match I called, I believe was Lawler, maybe done Bill Dundee or might've been Lawler Gilbert and man coming from LA and going to Memphis and going to the mid South Coliseum where there's 14, 15,000 people. And man, they take it seriously. And Lawler is God in that territory. I mean, I remember I would leave the arena with him in a limo or a car. Fans would run after the car for as long as they could run. I mean, he was the man. And I went back every Monday and got to meet, you know, Jeff Jarrett was a kid then starting out and Cactus Jack Manson was Mick Foley. And he was like, he looked like a teenager. And there was Uncle Elmer and, and Robert Fuller and the Stud Stable and Brick House. Brown. It was just these great wrestlers. And it was just the matches were great. Missy Hyatt and Eddie and Parsons. The, you know, it was just a really cool promotion. And, and they lasted with us for a while. And then I remember Jerry calling me, pitching me a fishing show. <laughs> and our network wasn't interested in a fishing show. And I believe that's what ended our relationship with the wrestling was not buying his fishing show. But I will say Tommy Gilbert was a great guy who was behind the scenes. Eddie Marlin, super nice guy, was behind the scenes. Dave Brown was another one of the announcers. They're really great guys down there. And, uh, you know, I, I thought they were all really cool. And I remember calling even a match between Tommy Gilbert and Eddie Marlin. It was a cowboy boot match. And the ring in Memphis was already covered with so many blood stains. You couldn't, it was unbelievable. And I remember them just breaking these cowboy boots over each other's heads and just blood everywhere and the fans going crazy. And I'd never seen anything like it. And that was sort of my entry into uh, wrestling. How did you like working with Lance Russell, my all-time favorite commentator? Of course, we did a big tribute show to him when he passed away last year. But what was it like for you coming out there? How aware of Memphis wrestling were you when you made the deal and started going to Memphis? And what was it like to sit there in the Mid-South Coliseum with Lance Russell? I mean, Lance was the nicest guy. Many times he picked me up at the airport and he would take, we'd go to have ribs on Beale street. And he really like took care of me and, and picked me up or drove me around. Was the nicest guy you've ever met. Just never a bad word to say to any, about anyone. I think everyone called him banana nose was his, uh, one of his nicknames. Cause I remember everyone always yelling banana nose. But you know, I had never announced wrestling and here I am sitting, you know, in the front row sharing a microphone, by the way, with him. And so we had one mic and just generous would let me talk during the match would ask me quite, I mean, I'm just a two bit color commentator really forced upon it because we're showing these matches on FNN. So I don't know if, you know, he wanted me there or if I was intruding, but you never got that from him. He was just generous, gracious, would include me and say my name during the matches. We got Broadway, Danny Wolf, here, you know, ringside and would really made me feel a part of every you know, F and N score match of the week. Cause I would just do one, you know, the main event. So no, nothing but praise for him. Just, you know, one of the all time greats and just one of the nicest guys you'd ever met, you know, want to meet. So you would fly in there and do commentary in terms of the tape. Did you wait for them to send you a tape or did you actually have some? Yeah, you did. Okay. No, I, I would wait for them to send the tape. They would edit it. It would come in three quarter would take them a few days. And it was the studio show. And then they would throw in the FNN score match of the week. So it wasn't the, the, the show from the Mid-South. It would be just this one match thrown into the stu- edited into their studio show, which I believe aired on Saturdays. And their show was, you know, I thought every bit as entertaining as the, uh, you know, the NWA shows. You mentioned Eddie Gilbert and Missy Hyatt before. What were they like? Loved them. Eddie was the nicest guy. And I remember him telling me uh, when he was younger, Jerry Lawler was a big, it was his idol. And he told me, you know, Danny, I had in my bedroom, I had pictures of Jerry Lawler plastered all over my bedroom. So when he'd have matches against Lawler, he always said, I can't believe I'd be in the ring with Jerry Lawler. Like to him, it was, he couldn't believe it. And he was the nicest guy. Missy was great. And I eventually got to do a little deal with them when they left. Then they opened up uh, Continental Wrestling which was also another Southern promotion. And we started airing their matches. And, but that was, I can't recall why that didn't go on as long as it did, but it was the same deal. We did a barter deal with them. They started sending us the matches and, you know, Eddie was trying to really, and in fact, I think Paul Heyman was helping him out at the time because they, was yeah. living, they were living together. Paul was living with Missy and Eddie in like Alabama, maybe. 
and he was helping him because I talked to him a few times on the phone and, you know, they were trying to get this, this promotion going and, you know, you would know better than I what happened to Continental. I don't know. Well, what happened was, yeah, Continental had been run by Ron Fuller. Ron Fuller sold it to a man named David Woods in Alabama. He hired Eddie Gilbert to be his booker. And then Eddie starts building up towards this big show. I think it was the road to Dothan. And of course, Eddie and David Woods get into a big fight before that point. And I don't remember if it was Eddie Mm -hmm. was fired or Eddie quit, but Eddie ended up leaving the company and pretty much all the, all the positive momentum that had been taking place seemed to end. Yep, that that I remember the the last name Woods. So yeah, that would be uh, that was interesting, interesting time. And and, and the fun part also, have, again, having a president of a network that was such a wrestling fan. I got to do two other things. I talked him into a pay per view called Super Clash, which wait, we did in Chicago. Wait, wait, wait! I didn't realize you were involved with Super Clash. I mean, obviously, everyone knows that pay per view. It's the AWA. It's Jerry Jarrett. World it was everybody. Class was yeah. How did you? I, I, I no, didn't realize I, that. I came up with that idea. Really? Um, actually, because there were other big pay-per-views being due. I mean, there was Starcade and the, you know, wrestling was just getting into pay-per-view and we figured it could be a good way to make some money. And I talked to Vern Gagne. I talked to Jerry Jarrett. I talked to some other promoters, even David McClain with Glow and said, let's do a big pay-per-view. We'll, us at FNN, we'll, we'll do it. And we'll find an arena, which we went to the UIC Pavilion in Chicago. And... It was really supposed to be a show of all these matches you would never see, cross-promoting like a wrestler from Portland against a wrestler from Florida, a wrestler from Minneapolis against a wrestler from Memphis, trying to sort of mix it all up. And, I mean, we had, uh, I think the main event was Lawler. And Kerry Von Erich. Could have been Kerry Von Erich, yeah. yeah. Could have been Von Erich. And we had Corporal Kirsch. I mean, uh, no, um, not Corporal Kirsch. It was the Colonel, uh, De, Colonel Beers. De Beers. yeah. He was on the show, and um, I believe we had Jimmy Valiant, the Boogie Woogie Man. I'm, I'm, we had a Glow. It might have been a Glow Battle Royal. It wasn't Glow. It was think. after Dave McClain had left Glow or and Pow. he had started it might Pow. Have been Pow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a Pow, and uh, you know, I became friends with David at that time. So it was really just this pay per view where we tried to mix up the promotions. I think uh, Vern's son was on the show. Greg Gagne was in a match. Yeah, a lot of people um, still waiting for Vern's check. That's funny. Yeah, I think Vern was still waiting for our check. I'm not sure how that worked, but I know there was a lot of confusion with the buy rate numbers. Well, well now, hold on. Maybe we can clear up some wrestling, uh, some wrestling news here. <laughs> it's always been said, you know, years ago, there was a Cauliflower Alley event where Chavo Guerrero mm-hmm. went after Vern Gagne because he was still upset about not being paid for Super Clash 3 at the end of 1988. The story had always been they thought Vern had the money and just wasn't paying everyone. That you think there's a chance Vern never got the money from you guys? No, I think uh, I remember there being a lot of confusion over the buy rate and collecting money from cable operators. And it was, I remember, a huge problem with the company we were working with, which was, I can't recall the, the company that does pay per view, and it was a split. And I think we had a lot of trouble collecting money from different cable operators and that's what you did so it was a 50 50 split with the cable operator and i think we didn't get a lot of money the accounting something happened i think Vern got some money but probably not all of his money it was a big cluster f and that's why we didn't do another one it was just became a massive headache but i know there was a lot of confusion and controversy over like where money was and who had money and who got paid and who didn't and it it turned into a, a wild headache but i mean we did the show it wasn't a bad show and uh you know, we tried something. And he even let me do a Cauliflower, Cauliflower Alley Club special because I went down to one of the shows and we did it as a one hour special on FNN called The Golden Age of Wrestling Revisited. Get out of here. I've never that seen that. I got to host. And it was, we, we did uh, me and Red Bastine and Hugh Malay hosted it. And that was basically a compilation of interviews I did at the Cauliflower, Cauliflower Alley Club that night. Or we, we taped interviews with John Tolis. Killer Kowalski, Buddy Rogers. I mean, there must have been maybe six or seven others. And I just sat down and did interviews with them and got stories, and that aired as a special. And it was called The Golden Age of Wrestling Revisited. You say that the head of FNN score was a big wrestling fan. Like, what level of wrestling fan? Could you actually talk to him about wrestling, or would he just remember names from the past? No, he, we would talk wrestling. Like, he, when he was younger, he, he was from 
back east. So he said, oh, I used to go to the garden, and I remember seeing this guy and that guy and Bruno and Buddy and, and was naming me these. He just was a big wrestling fan. So probably the reason California Championship Wrestling got on there before I got there is knowing Arnie probably wanted to go down and be a manager or do some kind of shtick with them because <laughs> that was sort of his dream. Um, and he became a boxing promoter and a pretty prominent boxing promoter after FNN, and now he's a singer who has albums out and tours the South. So he was just, no, just a, a big wrestling fan that would come to Memphis with me a few times and watch the matches. Just love being around, you know, that environment. But it's cool to have a boss that, uh, you know, lets you do things like that. I remember there was a, a band in the 70s called Seals and Cross. They had a song, Summer, Summer Breeze and Hummingbird and Diamond Girl. And I was a big fan, but they had broken up. And I remember reading a little blurb in the LA Times saying, Seals and Crofts coming back for a one-time reunion concert only for Baha'i Faith members at the Baha'i Faith Center. And I go, oh, I can't miss this. So I go into Arnie's office. I go, Arnie, I'm taking the afternoon off. I'm joining this religion. <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean joining a religion? I said, Seals and Crofts playing a one-time concert. I'm becoming a Baha'i. He goes, have fun. <laughs> and I literally went to this Baha'i Faith Center and had to read like five hours of literature and pamphlets, which they watch you read. And it's really hard to fake read when someone's watching you <laughs> for stuff you don't want to know. I did get my <laughs> ticket and go to the concert. and It was one of the best shows ever. But that's what a cool boss does. Let's you go join a religion in the afternoon, leave the office to get a concert ticket. Yeah. How was the concert? Unbelievable. <laughs> well, there you go. I guess it was, it was worth it. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. <laughs> I, I recommend anyone join a cult or religion if you can see a band that you may have never seen before. It's worth it. Hey, wasn't uh, Hawaii Wrestling with Liam Ivea promoting on FNN Score also? That might have been when I left. You know, I left there to start doing, you know, producing local sports and then started doing a lot of reality television shows, you know, in the infancy of that. So it might have been when I left, the network sort of lingered on a couple more years. And that probably would have been when I was gone. Well, if we could take a step back, uh, when the World Wrestling Federation first started going out west, which would have been the beginning of 1983, and, you know, obviously mm -hmm. it was the first place they hit on the expansion. They got the East Coast, they got the West Coast, they filled in everything in between. Were you going to those shows? Were you meeting the wrestlers? Oh, yeah. No, I went to every sports arena show once a month, same seats, front row mezzanine, probably where I think I started meeting, uh, met Dan and, and Kurt, never missed a show. And then somehow, and I don't remember the reason, started driving the guys from the Amfac Hotel about half hour from the sports arena back and forth. So I would drive the wrestlers to the sports arena, watch the show, and then always drive one or two or three of them back and hang out at the hotel with them, you know, until who knows what time in the morning. So I drove everyone from Kamala to Heenan to Sheik, Hogan, you know, everybody. During that time, Tito Santana, I mean, Slaughter, Jake Roberts, everybody. I drove either there or back. I'm sure you must have some crazy stories. And I say that because Kurt Brown, when he found out that I was going to be speaking with you, requested one specifically. He said, ask mm -hmm. Danny about Hercules Hernandez and the cocaine. Yeah, that was one night I drove. I think it was Sheik Hernandez, and it might have been somebody else. It might have been... Jim Brunzel or Barry Wynn, I don't know, and ended up back in Hernandez's room. And I think Sheik was in there and, and Hernandez and there may be one or two other guys. And some cocaine came out. And really, Hernandez didn't know me really from anyone. I was just sort of this guy that drove the wrestlers back and forth and, and was a fan. And I remember him saying, you know, shaking my hand and saying, what's your name again? And I shook his hand firmly and he shook my hand and then they wouldn't do anything. They just kind of sat around. A minute or two passes, and he comes back up to me. He goes, what's your name again? And shakes my hand. And I go, like I just told you a minute ago, my name's Danny Wolf. And he goes, oh, that's right. And like two or three minutes later, he does it again. Like three times in a row, he keeps shaking my hand. I don't know what he's doing. I'm figuring maybe he's already done some stuff. So then he goes, you know what? You'll have to leave the room. Can't be in here. <laughs> So I leave the room. I'm like, okay, well, you know, whatever. I'll go hang in the bar with George Steele or whoever else was in the bar, Jake Roberts, which was always fun too. And then I learned that there was this sort of code that the wrestlers used about shaking hands. And if you shook their hand firmly, you were sort of a mark. They wouldn't do things in front of you. If you didn't shake hard, if you almost, if you shake someone's hand very limp, 
and not squeeze. This was like a carnival code where it meant you were okay. You were on the inside. They can do anything or say anything in front of you. I didn't know this at the time. No one in Memphis or anyone ever told me about any kind of carnival code handshake. So I didn't know. And then one of the guys, and I can't remember who told me, no, you can't squeeze the hand. You squeeze the hand. It's kayfabe. They won't talk in front of you. You won't be part of, you know, whatever is going on. So then I learned from there on, don't, if you shake hand with a wrestler, just don't squeeze. What about Jake? You, you mentioned Jake. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he was great. I love Jake was, a, oh, he was a good guy. I really, I, I like him a lot. I always liked him. I thought his interviews were as good as any wrestler in the history of the sport. Just what he would say and the way he would say it and, Never yelled, never screamed, was always calm. One of the best gimmicks for sure of all time with Damien or whatever snake he had. But I thought one of the nicest guys I ever met. Truly one of the nicest guys. Just how big was the drug scene around wrestling in the mid-80s? From what I saw and heard, pretty prevalent. I think there was a lot of cocaine, certainly a lot of drinking. I mean, these guys drank a lot. I mean, they would close the bar down or even pay to keep the bar open past you know two or three in the morning because i'd been in there so now i knew coke was being done quite a bit and i don't know by who but i know it was around a lot but you know to me i mean again i was i was watching the show so to have a tito santana like jump in my car or kamala or whoever or even bundy to get a ride to the sports arena to a kid like me you know a guy like me it was this is incredible i'm driving these guys i watch every week on tv and they're just in my car what was it like for you in 1983 to all of a sudden have a new promotion, to all of a sudden have new wrestlers? I mean, some of them you already knew, obviously, and if you read the magazines, you probably knew all of them. But what was it like all of a sudden the World Wrestling Federation comes out west to have a brand new wrestling company? It was, in, it was unbelievable. It was, these were the stars. I mean, to me, the best days of the WWF were the 80s. When you actually, to me, I, I can't watch them anymore because the characters aren't there. I mean, they're almost all the same. They're all interchangeable. I liked when you had a, a missing link and a George Steele and a Kamala and a Don Morocco and a Sergeant Slaughter and a Sheik and Volkan. These were great characters. And everyone was so individual. Everyone stood up, you know, stood, for, you know, out on their own. That when they finally started coming out to the sports room, it's like, now we finally get to see them. Now, everything we watch on TV and the Saturday night main event and the challenge and the superstars. People in L.A. were going crazy. You couldn't get a ticket to the sports arena. Those shows sold out. They would announce the next month's show that night and what matches you would see next month. And people would literally run to the box office to get their tickets. So every single show sold out. I mean, it did well enough where I think WrestleMania 2, you know, this was one of the venues where they did the cage match. I think right. Bundy Hogan and, uh, you know, the, the sports arena was the place. So, I mean, no, L.A. went crazy for WWF. These were, that was the heyday. It was every month, never missed a month. And for years and years and years, then, you know, they went to the forum to do a few shows and, you know, uh, WCW came out to the forum at this time to do a few shows and it started getting muddied a little bit, but there was a good, I would say five or six, seven year period where myself and several other friends of mine never missed one monthly show at the sports arena. No, it was great. When did you first discover the newsletters? When I was working at FNN, Dave Meltzer, I believe maybe I gave him results from Memphis. The next morning I got back and would give him like sort of the lowdown on what happened at the Mid-South Coliseum and would kind of talk back and forth with, with Meltzer and became good friends with him. And then like other people shared the newsletters with people like Dan Farron. And, you know, that's how it worked back then. You stand at the Xerox machine at work, so they didn't have to subscribe, which we shouldn't have done, but Dave's a great guy. Uh, and I was reading the magazines. I was a Bill After fan, and I became friends a little bit with George Napolitano. So I would look at the magazines, too, because I just the pictures were great. And, you know, you got to see, you know, other territories and, and pictures. I remember there was even a TV show that Joe Pettacino did. It was kind of a weekly yeah, pro wrestling magazine this week. style. Pro Wrestling This Week would, would came on Saturdays here. And that was a great show because then you got to see highlights of these promotions. Because in L.A., there was no, there was no Internet. You didn't have a chance to see what was going on in Florida or that sometimes AWA wasn't being televised or up in Oregon. So that was a great show only because I think Bill after may have hosted it with them uh, to see highlights of these other promotions. 
if we can go back to when you would leave FNN, you said you got into producing, you got into reality TV. Did you still follow wrestling that whole period of time? And when did you first get an opportunity to do something with wrestling again? You know, I started, I, I continued to watch wrestling probably into the 90s. And I got, you know, hooked up on the Monday night, you know, watching Nitro and watching Raw. For several years, I'd tape and watch both of those shows. But, you know, when I, then I started doing a lot of reality in really 98, 99 and doing these box specials that I kind of, it was consuming my time so much, I sort of couldn't keep up with wrestling. So probably till around 2000 and the same time I started roller, you know, I got on a roller jam was probably about the time I stopped watching wrestling would have probably been sometime in the late nineties. Well, you bring up producing specials for Fox, the famous one. I mean, Mm -hmm. the late Dan Farron has been on the show talking about it was the Secrets of Pro Wrestling one. Now, you were on that one as well, correct? Yeah, that came about, uh, you know, there were a lot of specials were airing, and I believe that was for NBC, and it aired on a Sunday night. They buried it, like 7 o'clock on a Sunday, because they didn't like it. And it was a production company called Nash Entertainment, Bruce Nash, and I knew everyone there um, just from, this was a small town, and only about five or six companies doing all the reality shows. Bruce and people there knew I was into wrestling, even though I didn't work at that company, had called me and said, you know, we have an order from NBC to do a Secrets of Pro Wrestling reveal. Can you help us out? And even though I was at sort of a rival production company, I'm like, sure. You know, where are you going to shoot it? He goes, we're going to go to the Olympic Auditorium. We need some guys. And we got most of the guys were East Coast wrestlers. And I told Dan Farron, you know, we need a ref. You want to be the mask ref? And he's like, well, I don't know what that means. I'm like, just come to the Olympics. <laughs> You'll have a this striped mask and this. It's... So I remember Bruce saying, "Well, we want to do in this show when we're revealing, and the show looked good. Don Weiner, who was pr- pretty much the uh, executive in charge, it looked good. They said you're going to be the masked announcer in a scene or two. We want to do where the uh, the announcer cues the referee when they need to wrap up a match. I'm like, well, okay, I'll sit ringside." And I sat ringside with another gentleman who I can't remember. He was an ex-wrestler, kind of a big guy. And we get to the Olympic that day of the taping. It was shot in a few days. And I remember being told to go to wardrobe. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be just announcing, you know, what do you mean wardrobe? And it was a hanger with my name on it and a Zorro mask. (laughs) And I go like, what the F is this? And like, well, you don't want to be known, do you? I'm like, of course people are going to know me through a freaking little Zorro mask. But then I thought it was kind of funny. So if you watch the show, I'm the guy you see at ringside, like cueing Dan, basically to tell the boys to end the match. And I'm pointing a pencil or my finger is the cue. I don't even know if that ever it was real or not. <laughs> but I'm wearing this ridiculous little Zorro mask. And uh, NBC ended up not liking the show once it was edited. They just, I think we're expecting more. And it really wasn't revealing really that much that people didn't know by then. I mean, we weren't, you know, really breaking any codes or unveiling anything that a wrestling fan's not going to go, oh, my God, I can't believe that's what they do. Everybody knew everything by then. So NBC, I believe it was scheduled to be, you know, 8 o'clock on a Thursday night and ended up like Sunday at 7. They buried it. And uh, that was that was that. Well, let's go to Roller Jam because you also opened that door. Now, wrestling fans and fans of Roller Derby or Roller Games would remember Roller Jam from TNN. I believe in 1999, Mm -hmm. it was part of TNN along with ECW. It was kind of like a package thing. So I don't know too much about, you know, what went on with Roller Jam other than it was there and then one day it was gone. So you're the perfect guy to talk to about it. When did you first get involved with the project? And give us an idea of what the early days of Roller Jam were like. Roller Jam was a show created by two uh, television producers, Stephen Land, who was from Knoxville, Tennessee, and was doing a bunch of reality shows. And then a gentleman named Ross Bagwell, who had his own production company, also in the South, doing HGTV shows. And they merged together because they had read an article that jo- about Joni Weston and about roller derby and thought, you know what? Now's a good time to bring it back, but let's revamp it. Let's use inlines. Let's get a lot of hot young girls. Let's do a lot of pyro and cheerleaders. Let's do an updated version of roller derby. 
at the time I'd been announcing roller derby here in LA for the T birds and a couple of, you know, a couple other small promotions that would come and go. So they contacted me. I went to Florida and had to audition and audition to be play by play with Ken Resnick. Um, <laughs> they didn't ask me to do play by play. They said, how about you be the interviewer in the infield? And I thought better because Gene Okerlund was, I thought the greatest interview in the history of mankind, I can be like a Gene Okerlund and I'll be in the infield and won't have to worry about the play by play. So Ken Resnick got the job doing play by play and Lee Hawk Rearman, who was an American gladiator was the color. And then I was the interviewer. And, you know, we started in a soundstage in Orlando at universal studios, the same soundstage that actually became the, um, what was the wrestling promotion that was there that's oh, on top TV now? Or, yeah, TNA was using that soundstage when we left a few years later, but it was the same building. So we moved everything into the soundstage 21 at Universal in Orlando, and I would fly literally back and forth. I would do my Fox shows here in L.A. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, take the red eye to Florida Wednesday night. And then Thursday, we would do dress rehearsals and blocking. And then Saturday and Sunday, we would shoot either four or six shows like two matinee, two at the evening, and Sunday we do two matinee. So sometimes we'd shoot six one-hour shows in a weekend. Wow. And the rehearsals were pretty intense because we'd rehearse the games. We would write the games, the storylines. You know, it was soap opera just like wrestling. And I, and I have a much bigger appreciation for people that write soap operas in wrestling because it's not easy to come up with angles and how long does the angle last and how do you blow it off and what do you do with these guys next. There's a lot to it to keep it going. but. We went on with a lot of fanfare. Uh, USA Today covered us on the front page, you know, the resurgence, the new roller derby, inline skates, hot girls. And the first, we did 160 episodes over four seasons. The first few seasons were really good because it was about the skating. And fans liked the kind of rough and tough and the speed and the skating and, and the hot girls. As time went by, TNN... And we shared TNN with like, you know, as monster trucks and us. That was kind of what Friday nights were. There was no ECW the first few seasons. As we went along, the network kept telling us, be more like the WWF. Bring in more characters, do more storyline. So it started, this turn started where Roller Jam became more skits and sketches and evil commissioners and twin brothers and blood transfusions and we were doing all these crazy antics and it was becoming less about the skating and you could tell the fans were not enjoying it as much. We were becoming too uh, cartoonish and it wasn't about the skating anymore. And we would hear from the fans, but our hands were tied because the network was telling us we want you to be more like wrestling. Now ECW at this time gets a deal with TN uh, TNN and they are, I believe our lead in or they were on after us. And there was one weekend where I heard, well, there's going to be a bunch Axel Rotten and a bunch of the ECW wrestlers are going to come to Roller Jam. We're going to do a cross promotion. So there'll be one week where the ECW wrestlers are in the infield helping the New York Enforcers, who are our heel, you know, our redshirt team. And I'm like, great. And then some of the Roller Jam wrestlers will go and do a taping of ECW. So we're like, great. So about six, seven, eight guys from ECW come to Florida come in the infield, cause all sorts of havoc. It was, it was a, it was a cross promotion thing. It was just really just to promote their show. Then we were getting ready to go back East to do an ECW. And they told us, don't bother. You're not invited. <laughs> so the ECW wrestlers actually came and got on our show, but then we weren't allowed on their show because they hated us. They actually ended up blaming us as being this like crappy lead in and nobody was watching roller jam Friday night. So nobody then was watching ECW after us. To me, the problem was we should have never been on Friday night. It's a terrible night to have, I believe roller derby or wrestling kids are out and there's football games and Friday at eight or nine o'clock is probably the worst time slot to ever have that kind of sport. So our ratings were never that good and our show cost a ton of money. If you ever see the production value in Roller Jam, it was 12 cameras. It was Pyro, our fourth season. How much per we episode? Left Universal. We did, uh, per season, we did 40 episodes. How much did each episode cost? Oh, in the, uh, at that time? Oh, probably close to a half million. But for that network, that was a lot of money. 
And we really weren't pulling numbers, but we were filling time. So we were going to do a fifth season. And this was now the time we were planning on trying a tour. That Roller Jam was going to go. We'd been to Vegas and did some tapings in season two at the MGM Grand. We did, I think, 14 shows there. But everything else was at Universal. And then we moved to Kissimmee down the road because we took over an old abandoned American Gladiator dinner theater building. And we opened the Roller <laughs> wait, Jam. Wait, arena. hold on, so hold we, on, hold on. I got to stop you there. American Gladiator dinner theater? In Florida, in Kissimmee, there was a like a medieval times type show where people can go watch or participate in American Gladiators. <laughs> and it was a dinner theater that had not lasted long. One of the gladiators, Tim Washington, the big nasty, actually was one of our skaters on Roller Jam. And what happened is it went under and this building was sitting there and we said, you know, we're getting a little tired of the, the soundstage look and couldn't get huge crowds in because the track took up a lot of that soundstage and cameras, et cetera. So we took over this building and made it the Roller Jam Arena. We would draw 1,800 people. We would do pretty well there. But we do our fourth season. We're going to plan a tour. So we announced dates in like 20 cities from Pittsburgh to Tampa to St. Louis. And getting ready to do our fifth season, and we're already starting to write storylines. And we knew the WWF at this time was planning on leaving USA Network. If man wanted to get off USA, the word was he was going to come on to TNN and bring Monday Night Raw. Of course, we're loving this. We're like, this is the best news in the world for Roller Jam. Can you imagine sharing a network with the WWF? How much better we'll do? Maybe we'll be the lead in the Monday Night Raw, or maybe we'll be on, you know, afterwards. We just thought this was going to help us tremendously. Now, I'm at work one day and I get a phone call and it's, we're canceled. It was that. One phone call, we're off the air. The same day McMahon signed the deal at TNN, which we thought would be the best day for us, turned to the day we got canceled. And the story that I had heard was McMahon at one time tried to purchase Roller Jam. And the two guys that ran Roller Jam basically blew him off. Said, you know, you have your show, and we got our show. Who are you? And when you're a Vince McMahon and you come on to a new network, you have the clout and the power, obviously, to tell the network, you know your little roller derby show on Friday night? Get rid of it. And we were got rid of that day. The day he signed was the day we got canceled. That was the end of Roller Jam. We had all these storylines we were working on, the tour, and next thing it was like, nope, we're done. And the, the sad thing is I had told the owners of Roller Jam, go to USA, go to TBS, go to another network with the show, we can even scale it down, but don't let it die. The problem is when you have two entities running, you know, a sport, which was very big for them. These were TV guys. We just, to them, we were a canceled TV show and they moved on and did other shows. They weren't like a Vince McMahon type where it's your whole life. The Roller Jam to Steven and Ross, who were the executive producers and owners, Roller Jam was just a show. And it was just a show that got canceled and they did other shows. It had to be run by someone like a McMahon or, you know, someone where it was all they had and would have made every effort to get it somewhere else or find a home for it. And they just didn't. They just, it was like, yeah, all right, I guess we got canceled. That's okay. And that it just died that day. Going back to when ECW wrestlers appeared on Roller Jam and then it was not reciprocated. ECW pulled out of the deal for Roller Jam performers to appear on their show. How did the network react to that? I got to think if they're the ones setting it up, they would be the ones pissed off the most by it. You know what? They weren't. The ECW was, was doing better than we were. And I think, I, I don't know this for a fact, but they probably told the network, you know, we really are not interested in having them on our show. The fans all end up tearing them apart. They're not going to get any cheers or pop. Really, ECW fans despise us. And the, everything about the ECW they just didn't like our show. They didn't like what we were doing. They didn't like that we were trying to be like wrestling. So it was never a question of the network enforcing it or saying, no, oh, you know, we want Mark D'Amato or Sean Atkinson or some of our, our bigger names to come into an ECW. They would have been eaten up alive. And it's probably in hindsight best that we didn't uh, go and do one of their shows because it would have been a nightmare. We, in fact, we, there was a show in Florida. ECW did a house show in Florida. And myself and Mark D'Amato and a couple of skaters went to watch. 
And we were in this balcony, and I remember ECW fans just flipping us off the whole time and telling us to go home, and Roller Jam sucks, and they were doing Roller Jam sucks chants, and we left. So, in hindsight, it's probably good we didn't never went on their show. And that was in Florida. Imagine Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been horrible. Yeah. I think yeah. I, it wouldn't have gone over well. They just didn't, I mean, you know, it's just. ECW was so it was so hardcore at that time, and the fans were so rabid, and their and their fan base was unbelievable. Not like any other promotion, they live, eat, drink, breathe wrestling. They chant through the whole show. To to them, our show was a joke. It was popcorn. It was fluffy. It was you know nice. It was wannabe wrestling, but not a you know, but failing. So that promotion and what we did on Roller Game did not mesh at all. One was on one side of the spectrum. We were on the other. Do you think Roller Jam did enough to attract old Roller Derby and Roller Game fans? At first, yes, because we were trying to be what Roller Derby was in the heyday, and that was about tough, hard scoring and skating. As time went on, I would hear from Jerry Seltzer, whose father invented Roller Derby, and Jerry you know, owned the Bay Bombers. Jerry was our commissioner in season one was on camera, presented the Founders Cup on behalf of his father, Leo. You know, they were very tied in, a lot of the old school. Season two, season three, Jerry left, who didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. They didn't, the traditionalists didn't like the direction we were going in because, again, like I said earlier, it wasn't now about the skating. It was about the theatrics. It was about the soap opera. It was about this, the storyline. It was about skits and sketches. And even to where we had... You know, the two most hated skater reveal, you know, uh, Mark D'Amato and Sean Atkinson were rivals where we did a whole angle where they found out they were actually brothers. And we did a fake blood test with this nurse who was an actress after a game who took Sean's blood. And then we revealed that they were actually brothers. But then Mark D'Amato came up with the scheme that he was dying and needed a kidney. So we shot at a hospital in Orlando where Sean was going to give Mark his kidney. And we go to some hospital on like a Thursday night to let us use a room. And I'm standing between them doing an interview that's going to be rolled into Roller Jam. Like, this is unbelievable that one skater would give another skater his kidney when they just found out they were brothers, but they're adversaries. And it was all D'Amato's scheme to leave the hospital once Sean was under and they were opening him up. And D'Amato would go back to the arena and skate a game and Sean couldn't make it for the his team. <laughs> and then what happened was... They have me running out of the hospital in a gown and socks or whatever, and a thing on my head, and running to the car, going, "I'm going to stop this." I'm going to. And this, it was one of the episodes I think in season three, and you see me then cut to running in the arena, stop the game, stop the game, and I run to the infield, and there's Demato, and they had rolled on the giant mega, you know, our big television we had in the arena, what gone on in the hospital, and I literally run and stop the game shove D'Amato and say, what kind of human being does that to another to make someone lose a kidney for no reason? And I push him. And then his reaction was, do you want it, Wolf? And then he basically beat the crap out of me in the infield and tore all my clothes off. So that's what Roller Jam was becoming. And people, along with an answer to come back to your first question, no, people that really, the, the true Roller Derby fans did not like what we were doing the last couple of seasons at all. But ironically, Ann Calvello came to skate a match race in our last season to say she had competed in seven decades of a sport. Ann yeah. Calvello was a big red shirt skater, was Joni Weston's adversary, skated, you know, East Coast, and, and then, of course, against the Bay Bombers. So she came to basically skate in the year 2000 to mark seven decades of competing in a sport. So we had her in a match race with our commissioner, against our commissioner. And uh, that was actually kind of cool. You never got to interview Georgia Haas, did you? Oh, you, Georgia Haas, <laughs> growing up, was my idol. <laughs> there was no general manager or manager against the T-Birds that worked the mic, got a crowd going more than Georgia. When I went to the form, the first time to go to roller derby, it was a triple header, T-Birds, Bombers, and Devils. She was the general manager of the Detroit Devils. I had index cards I brought and put little stickers of the team colors, little stars, to get autographs. 
I did not want to leave that day without an autograph from Georgia Hawks. So the show ends, everyone, which is tradition at roller derby, everyone's invited to the track to get autographs and photos. Even to this day, it's the only sport that does that. So when a game is over, good guys, bad guys, everybody from both teams remains at the track. Every fan can get a photograph or autograph. Georgia goes right back to the locker room, so I don't get anything. Say to myself, I'm going to go to the parking lot area, this ramp where all the cars drive when they leave. Standing there with my friend Louie with my little white index card with little red stickers on it, and the place is emptied out. There's not one car, one fan. The form is empty. And I said, there's no way she's left. I've seen every car that's driven out of here. All of a sudden, this blue Toyota Corolla comes up the ramp, and it's Georgia Haas. <laughs> I'm talking three hours after the game ended. She gets out of her car, signs an autograph. I, I tell her, obviously, I, I was dumb. I couldn't believe I was meeting her and telling her just how great she was. And signed the autograph, which to this day I still have on my dresser. And as time went on, I became very good friends with her. I got to interview her several times in the last, she passed a couple of years ago, but even 10 years ago, five years ago, four years ago, she was still coaching the Devils against the Bombers up north and games here. Got to interview her dozens of times, and she would poke her finger in my chest and call me Buster and do all the stuff she would do to Jim McInerney when I was a kid. The only problem is I always had a grin or a smile on my face, and she always said, Danny, you can't smile or grin at me when I'm doing this to you. And I said, I can't help it. I can't believe you're doing to me what I watched you do when I was, you know, 10 years old and 11 years old. It's so great. It's like, I can't believe it's happening. And we ended up driving the games together. And then she asked me to induct her into the Hall of Fame a few years before she passed. And I it was one of the thrills of my life that I inducted George into the Roller Derby Hall of Fame. And now we became very good friends. And the thing about George and anyone who's never seen her should literally go on YouTube and find any L.A. Tiber Detroit Devil games. Or She was in the infield, obviously, for other games as well. But probably the greatest heel, red shirt personality ever, but she never knew it. She was always surprised that people asked her for her autograph or was always like, I don't get, I didn't do anything, she would say. Like, I don't know why people thought I was good at what I did. I just went out there and acted mean. And I'm like, that's why you're so great. Cause you didn't even know what you were doing was affecting everybody. And it was so unassuming to her and she never got it. She never understood how, why people liked her. And like you yelling at the cameraman to get that camera out of my face, Buster, if I've told you once, I've told you a million. And she would point at the camera and yell at the camera. I said, as a kid watching, you were my superstar. You were the greatest person on television. You were better than the Fonz. You were better than Bob Newhart or Sanford. You were like, to a kid, the greatest person on TV. And she just never got it. It was really weird. She never knew what she did mattered or that people thought she was that great. She just never understood. Is there a version of kayfabe for roller derby? Like for a heel in roller derby to, obviously you said they all go on the track and they sign autographs and take photos, but does a heel keep the heel attitude or once the game's over, does everything end? Is there a kayfabe for roller derby? Not really. Um, it's funny, all the skaters, there's like husband, husband, wife, wife, husband, wife, father, daughter, father. It's a very incestuous sport where it's like a lot of the skaters are related. Everybody's friends. There really is no kayfabe, to be honest with you. When the game's over, both teams are really side by side on the track signing autographs. Kind of everything ends. It's for the fans. Roller derby, it, it's hard to explain how much the fans mean to the skaters and the appreciation. It's not like any other sport. I mean, you can't go to a Laker game and they don't invite all the fans down to get, you know, autographs to the play. They go back to the locker room. These skaters will stay until every last fan has gotten a picture and autograph. And that's required. Good guys, bad guys. If they've been feuding, you know, beating the crap out of each other, they could still be five or 10 feet away signing autographs and taking pictures. When the game ends, the feuds end. It's all about the fans and giving back to the fans. And there's no sport in the world that does that. And that's what I love about it. Cause you see these fans after who've been screaming and yelling at the bad guys and the, you know, the red shirt skaters. And when the game's over, you can come get a picture with them or an autograph. And it's there's something about there's a connection. 
that you don't see anywhere else, certainly not in professional wrestling, because you would never be at a WWF show where every wrestler just hangs out in the ring afterwards. But in, in roller derby, it's different. There's, it's really like a big family. That's the best way to describe it. And it's no secret the skaters will come to the games together in the same car, even if they're skating against each other. And, and if you remember the T-Birds, if you, during their heyday, they were one team. The, the Devils, the Bombers, the Outlaws, and the uh, Chicago Hawks were really just team names. They, these teams didn't exist. There was no team in Detroit. And there was no team in Chicago. And there was no team. If the T-Birds went to Chicago, the T-Birds were the face. They were the white shirt. They were America's team. So these other teams were just teams to skate against. They were just villain teams. And they were makeshifts. So Harold Jackson, who was one of the greatest redshirt skaters, would be on the Chicago Hawks one week, the Devils another week, and the Outlaws another week. Like, they were all interchangeable. All the teams that skated against the T-Birds there was a core group of sort of red shirt villain skaters that would just sort of move from team to team all the time. There were makeshift teams each week. The T-Birds were sort of, that was the, that was, like I say, America's team. That team didn't change. So it, it, it's, it's such a different sport. I mean, in fact, I'm looking at a, on my wall right here, an LA T-Birds poster. And it says, Olympic Auditorium, 18th and Grand Avenue, downtown Los Angeles, with a 213 phone number to buy tickets from Ticketmaster. I don't know what year this is, but uh, it lives with me. I've got so much roller derby memorabilia on my walls because it just makes me happy. The wrestling business obviously changed with Vince McMahon's expansion and a lot of the territories and smaller companies got put out of business or chased out of business in some mm-hmm. ways. But with roller derby, after the boom... It was, in many ways, a whole different animal. And I'm wondering what it was like for, you know, we've mentioned Ralphie Valadares a few times, because that's a name I got to know when I was a little kid. Roller Games was on TV here in New York Mm -hmm. after WWF Wrestling. Yeah. What is it like for those guys, those T-Birds and other people, when it seems like there's always a little bit of a revival, and then it goes away, and a revival, and it goes away? Do they sit around waiting for that? Do they expect it? Do they go on with their lives? What's it like after Roller Derby as all this other stuff is happening? It's interesting you say that because it's in your blood. It's in your blood. We still have games, a couple games a year, with some of the same skaters that skated roller derby in the 70s. Can't not skate a game. You know, everybody had jobs, and everyone has jobs. You can't live off a roller derby. Like you said, I've announced for probably four or five different roller derby promotions in the last 15, 20 years. They can't last because, A, they can't get on television. And without television, it's too hard to promote games. No one knows there are games. You can't put flyers up on the side of walls or run commercials at 3 in the morning because the spots cost $10. The last promoter of roller derby was a gentleman named Dan Ferrari that was keeping it going up north and down here because he was a fan and had a lot of money. And he was able to promote games. And we did get on TV and you know up in Northern California on some ABC affiliate at like 1 a.m. And... All the skaters, even up until the game I called two months ago, a lot of them are in their 50s. A lot of them are in their 60s. A lot of them skated in the 70s and 80s when they were really young. There's no roller derby school for new skaters to come train. So if you wanted to do a roller derby game, and the girl leagues to me doesn't count as roller derby, and I kind of ignore that even exists. But if you were to do a traditional co-ed roller derby game, and wanted to put two teams together, where are you going to get the skaters? You have to dig back into getting a Larry Lewis or a you know, skinny mini Gwen Miller who passed away you know, a few months ago, yeah. but was still skating last year. And a lot of these skaters I grew up watching in the very late 70s or early 80s even, were still skating today. Ralphie, Dave Martinez, Ralphie's nephew still skates. Ralphie's daughter, Gina Valadera skates. Tony Trujillo, a lot of people, Ray Robles, these people that skated on the T-Birds in 1979, half of them can still skate today and still do. They can't not skate in a game when there's a game. It's really weird. It's hard to explain. But when it's in your blood, these skaters can't not go back out on the track. No matter what they look like, no matter if they're out of shape, they have to be on the track and do the game. It's like no one else can do it. So you have to rely And yeah, it doesn't always look great to have gray-haired skaters, but you know what? They can still do it. And they understand the sport, and they understand enough to put on a great game and have it come down to the wire and have the fans go crazy. That still happens no matter how old you are because they know how to do it. 
But most of the games we've been doing, I would say in the last 15 years, most of the skaters are the same skaters you saw. I mean, little Richard Brown skated last year when I came out here. I mean, little Richard Brown was skating in the 60s. He came and skated our game here, actually it was two years ago, and skated Roller Jam, of course. So it's it's really weird that, yeah, I mean, if you want to do a roller derby game, what pool do you, you know, dig into to find your teams? You have to get these people that skated back then because there's no one else. You brought up interviewing Georgia Haas. You couldn't keep the smile off your face. I recently saw a video clip of a very similar moment where you couldn't seem to keep the smile off of your face. You're talking to Johnny Legend, and Lucky Pierre oh. sneaks up behind you. Oh, and God. It seems to assault you, but this seems like the perfect transition to talking about your time around. Now, correct me, because I always get it confused. Was it the incredibly strange wrestling, or was it extremely strange wrestling? What was it exactly? Now, this Johnny Legend, who's sort of been a fringe wrestling manager character from Hollywood, Eric Caden, his friend who owned the Hollywood Book and Poster Company, big wrestling fan, said, let's do incredibly strange rock and wrestling. There's a club right off Hollywood Boulevard called Moguls. Let's do shows once a month. We'll have a band play. We'll have a match. We'll do a band, couple matches. So it was rock and roll and wrestling. And between Kurt Brown and Dan Farron, who basically were the matchmakers, there was about a group of maybe 10 or 12 guys out here, young wrestlers, some lucha, that would come to the shows. And we would do, you know, six or seven matches. We were the pick of the week in L.A. Weekly. We were always sold out. You couldn't get into an incredibly strange rock and roll. We were the thing to do in Hollywood for the, the few years we did it. And again, it would be, you know, Johnny Legend's Rockabilly Bastards that would play three songs. Then we do two matches. Another band. And we try to get local bands with a little bit of a following, but we didn't need it after a while because wrestling fans were flocking to our shows. What made incredibly strange rock and wrestling so great is the characters. I mean, Sister Slash, the wrestling nun from hell. <laughs> um, Hooventude Gonorrhea, Harley Racist, the Ku Klux Clown, <laughs> Mary Tyler Moron, um, D- Doink Diggler, the Porno Clown, El Irregulario, who would go to the bathroom during the match and then come back with toilet paper out of his pipe <laughs> and shit off. Um, El Asesino Postal, the Killer Postman, um, Los Hobos, Backpack Mac and Panhandle Randall. Los Hobos. Were a very good <laughs> And uh, Cletus the Fetus Kincaid, who was a wrestler that would put a live fetus in a burlap sack and put, try to put his re- uh, opponent's face in the sack so the fetus can render him unconscious, and then you can pin him. The fetus, I think, was one of those balls you wind up and it moves on its own. <laughs> so if you saw this burlap sack that Cletus the Fetus would put in the corner, it would move because he would wind the ball up before and it would last for a few minutes. But <laughs> the, the fun of that was doing, and Tammy Tampon, she wrestles the right kind of girls at the wrong time of the month. That was another big character. We, so we had like great, funny characters, but the wrestling was good. Like Kurt could do three or four characters, including Lucky Pierre, and, and Dan would be the commissioner and or the referee. I would announce the matches live to the house and ring announce. In fact, one time I did actually win the under the top rope battle royal. Oh, because I called each wrestler into the ring. We did a battle royal and I got knocked when I the match with the bell rang. I was trying to get out of the ring and I got hit. So I basically laid on the apron and the match went on around me and I had to just lay there with my eyes closed and let every all this act and boy, the ring was just going up and down and you're getting seasick and wrestlers are going over me and under me and through me. And it turned out that I was the last one on the apron when it was over. So even though I was knocked out when the match started, I did win the under the top rope battle royal. Who booked that? Under the bottom. No, I think it was under the bottom <laughs> rope battle royal. That was it. it. Was under the bottom rope battle royal. But we did all sorts of gimmicks, and it was. I'm. Ta- we've been talking about flirting with doing more incredibly strange shows again, but really, you got to have the right venue. We had this great club in Hollywood that was perfect with the music and had a stage and a floor big enough for a ring and other rooms. So. It, finding a perfect venue is what, you know, it's all about that. But I have no doubt if we started doing those shows again, we would sell every one of them out. So we had like 40 of these amazing, cool characters that 12 guys would play. And we would just interchange with masks or costumes in the back. So, you know, it's like having 40 different wrestlers, but you only need a dozen. And you keep doing all these characters every month. 
and it worked. It worked. We were, I mean, Chris Farley called the matches with me one week before he died. Sage Stallone used to come. Chris Jericho came to a few of our, I mean, we started getting wrestlers would, if they were in town, would stop by and see our shows. And the wrestling quality was really good. It wasn't schlocky. It wasn't campy. I mean, it was campy, but the wrestling was really good. These were actually wrestlers that trained and worked out and actually, you know, several of them, you know, ended up in the WWF as jobbers or, you know, in, in other capacities. So no, incredibly strange rock and wrestling was great. And it may be making a comeback, you say. We've been, Kurt's talked about it, Dan's talked about it, Eric Caden passed away, unfortunately, Johnny Legends in Northern California, so it would have to be put on, not with our original gang, but with the right, again, the right club, and it has to really be done in a club, in the Hollywood area, I think we could do a, make a comeback. And we've talked about it for years, about doing another show or trying to do a few more shows, and, you know, it's just, when you're in the rhythm of doing it at the time, it was it's much easier. Once it disbands and you know someone passes away and someone moves up north and people are getting older and they're not wrestling or staying, we'd have to reinvent and start over. But I have no doubt that it would immediately be successful again. Boom! There it is, Broadway Danny Wolf. Thank you so much for being a part of the Super Podcast. And what a fantastic show we've had this week, Howard. Before we wrap things up, anything you want to say to the listeners? Anything you want to plug? Uh, Hardway Art. Hardway Art on Facebook right now. We're switching servers uh, so we can give you a new improved website experience. You can still put your name uh, down in the old website, hardwayart.com. But check us out at Facebook slash Hardway Art. I've got all my vintage magazine photos up there. You can communicate with me personally. I'm going to be putting all kinds of rare correspondence, stuff from promotions and stuff up there. But I promise you, this is my promise to the wrestling fan, we are coming up with some really, really cool stuff that is going to debut very shortly. So hardwayart.com on Facebook is your best bet. Feel free to friend me, friend me on the Facebook. And as always, I can see you guys friends just like Brian does. And I really appreciate the opportunity, and I consider it an honor each and every time, and it has been a blast as always. Well, I love having you here, Howard, and you'll be back on the show really, really soon. But as we wrap things up, a few notes. Of course, you can follow the show on Twitter at 605pod. You can follow me on Twitter at GreatBrianLast, and you can follow the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network on Twitter at SuperPodcast. I also want to make mention... Many of you have been waiting for it. The new Mid-South Wrestling Television Review Podcast with myself and Mike Mills of the Booking the Territory Podcast is now available. Wherever you find your favorite podcast, search for the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review and check that out now. I know a lot of listeners were really waiting for that, and the reaction so far has been, quite frankly, overwhelming, and thank you to everyone. Check that out now, the new Mid-South Wrestling Television Review with me and Mike Mills. Of course, you can follow the show on Facebook, the Facebook page, facebook.com slash superpodcast. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it in a number of ways, including getting 605 Super Podcast merchandise, T-shirts, stickers, magnets, and so much more. The very popular Mothership T-shirt or baseball shirt, as well as all the classic 605 Super Podcast design shirts. You can get all of that from the official online store, tinyurl.com slash superpodstore. Get that and support the Super Podcast. And of course, we mentioned it earlier, to support the Super Podcast on Amazon, tinyurl.com slash superpod. Amazon is the one link you need for all of your Amazon purchases. If you'd like to make a donation to the show, you could do so in a couple of different ways. You can make a one-time donation to paypal.me slash superpodcast. Or if you'd like to make an ongoing monthly donation to the show, you can at patreon.com slash superpodcast. We don't give you free shows for Patreon or anything. It's just a way for you to support this show. If you like the show, support it there. We guarantee you nothing. No free shows or anything else. We guarantee you nothing. And I want to thank everyone who does support this show. We really do appreciate it. We've had a lot of new listeners recently. Thank you for everyone who's come aboard the mothership, and we uh, hope you enjoy the ride here on the show. Of course, you can get this show on iTunes. Please, if you do subscribe on iTunes, leave us a five-star rating and a positive review. It really does help the show out. If you don't like iTunes for some reason, you can go to 605pod.com to access the show. All episodes are available for download there, as well as the RSS feed for those of you who want to do it manually, 605pod.com. 
The 605 Super Podcast is brought to you this week by Ramsor Records. Once again, we want to remind you, Sammy Miller and the Congregation coming up very soon. Get more information at SammyMillerCongregation.com. Our friends, the wrestling fans over at Ramsor Records. Want to remind you about the other fine shows on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, including Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry, Kentucky Fried Wrestling with Scott Bowden, Ron Fuller's Studcast, Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam and Sean Goodwin, and of course the brand new Mid-South Wrestling Television Review. All podcasts available wherever you find your favorite podcast, or just search for any of those shows, and you will find more information. And all information is available also at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. If there's anything you'd like to mail into the show, you could do so by sending it to the 605 Super Podcast, P.O. Box 1242, Morristown, New Jersey, 07962. That's the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! P.O. Box 1242, Morristown, New Jersey, 07962. The 605 Super Podcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. For Howard Baum, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!